Um, I'm just going to say a few words about Jay Smith, who's our speaker today. Um, he grew up in northern India, and he studied in, in America. He spent five years with his wife in Singal in West Africa, and has spent the last five years in London doing a PhD in um, the sources of Islam. He, he's um, a speaker at Speaker's Corner in London on Sunday afternoons, and there's a few people from, from there here today. So, um, just welcome. Thank you. <laughs> this is Jan Sheep from the Islamic Society. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to welcome uh, all the Muslims and all the non Muslims to this event organized by the Islam Society and the Christian Union. Inshallah, today we've come on a common, common platform to debate with each other. So I request everybody in the audience please to keep etiquettes, both the Muslims and the non Muslims. No shouting, please, from the audience. Each speaker will have a chance to respond to each other. So if you feel that while one speaker is speaking, you don't agree with him, don't shout out, please. I ask both people, non Muslims and Muslims, to observe etiquettes. The speakers will have a chance to respond to each other. Uh, this is Brother Shabir Ali, he's from Canada. I'll just give you some brief, so a brief information about him. Uh, he comes, as I said, from Canada. He's president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Centre there. He's an author of many books, many that deal with the topic that we're dealing with today, including 101 Contradictions in the Bible and uh, the Quran and Science. He's the father of four children, and he's actually debated with Mr. Smith before also in Manchester. So before, without wasting any more time, I'll hand over to Mr. Smith, who will begin the debate. This afternoon, the topic that we've uh, decided to talk on is, is the uh, Bible or the Quran? We're going to be doing a discussion, Shabir and I, on what is the authenticity of these two books. Now, one of the problems that we've had as Christians and as Muslims when we talk to each other, uh, we have this problem when we come together at Speaker's Corner, we have this problem when we're on uh, university campuses, we tend to talk past each other. And we tend to have a difficult time explaining what we believe and a foundation for our beliefs to people who are not Christians. One of the things I want to do today is to is to ask that very question. How can the Muslims or how can the Christians come to a non-believing world, the university world, the world that we're living in right here, and come with a, an explanation, a background, a foundation, a way of understanding whether God speaks to the Bible or whether God speaks to the Quran? How are we going to do this? It's very difficult. Most of you who are sitting here, I assume you're believers, you believe in God, we're not, we don't have a difficulty at time uh, at least dealing with that issue, but how do we know when God speaks to us? Because God does speak to us. The Muslims believe in the Rasuls, we believe in prophets, we have very many similarities there. How do we know when God speaks to us and how do we know what God says, whether or not it's authentic or not? What, how are we going to use this premise and how are we going to explain it to those outside? That's what I want to address. What can we use? What criteria can we use? Where can we start from? As Muslims and Christians, of course, we already assume God exists. We already assume He does reveal Himself to, to His uh, people, through His prophets. But as a person who is a non-believer, and there are some here who are non-believers, you're not really asking us whether or not the Quran or the Bible is better than each other. What you're asking is whether or not it is true. If you're going to commit yourself to Islam, if you're going to commit yourself to Christianity, you don't want to commit yourself to a religion or a way of beliefs that is not true, obviously. Now, as a Christian, I've grown up as a Christian, I've been imbibed with the Bible teachings, I've had it as my background. Mr. Shabir Ali has grown up as a Muslim, he's had that background, so therefore we do have a bias, we have an agenda we're coming from. And what I want to do today is I want to try to answer that question so people, even the unbelievers, cannot, can understand why is it that I believe, personally, the Bible is the Word of God and not the Quran. Now the criteria that I'm going to use today is historical analysis. I'm going to look at verification, I'm going to look at the source criticism, I'm going to look at looking at three different areas. I'm going to look at manuscript evidence for the Quran and the Bible, documentary evidence for the Quran and the Bible, and archaeological evidence for the Quran and the Bible. Now why do I do that and why do I use that? 
We don't believe that the Bible and the Quran are historical books. That's agreed. Christians and Muslims have no problem with that. But the Bible and the Quran do talk about history. They talk about people. They talk about places. And they talk about events. These are historical people. These are historical places. These are historical events. It's when the Bible and the Quran touches people, place, and events that we can investigate it. That we can look and ask, is there any corroborative evidence? Is there any historical evidence that substantiates those peoples, those places, and those events? That is why I want to use that as my platform today. And that's what my paper is going to be on. That's what I'm going to talk about. Let's get started. I don't have much time. I didn't have to rush through this. This paper that I'm giving you today is on our website. You can pick it up on debate.org.uk later on when you go home. You can read it in, uh, in more in depth. Let's start then with the Quran. What is the manuscript evidence for the Quran? Now, Muslims tell us that the Quran was compiled, was put together around the mid-7th century, compiled by a man named Zayd ibn Thabit. It was compiled in uh, Mecca. And at that time, during the time of Uthman, uh, the third caliph, it was put together in the Quran as we know it today. Around 646 to 650 is the date that I've been, that I've been given. I assume I'm correct on that, around that time. The question we ask, and the question that historians are asking, the question that people are asking is, if there was a Quran that was compiled in 650, are there any examples of it? Do we have any examples of that Quran? Where are the manuscripts of that original Quran? According to Islam, what we know is that four copies were made. One was sent to Basra, another was sent to Baghdad, another was sent to Damascus, and one was left in Medina. Where are they? Can we get our hands on them? Where is this Uthmanic recension that the Muslims keep talking about? Muslims have come up with a few ideas. There have been some manuscripts that they've come forward with. Two of them that I want to talk about today, which are probably the most popular that I've heard about over and over again, are the Topkapi manuscript, which is in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul, Turkey, and the Samarkand manuscript, which sits in the Samarkand the, uh, the, in Uzbekistan, Tashkent. I'm sorry, I got it mixed up. The Topkapi is in Istanbul, the Samarkand is in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan. These are the two ones that I've heard most often. I'm, I'm, they're the ones I would, have, I would assume that we need to discuss today. Let me just, uh, if, Alex, if you just put that on our overhead, let me just show you a script. No, not that one. Just put here. I want to show you the script from the Samarkand documents. I want you to look at it because how are we going to assess the date on this document? How do we do that? How do you do that with any manuscript? How is this uh, dates for any manuscript assessed and uh, delineated? One of the first things you do is you look at the script and you start making, asking some questions. If you look at the script here, you'll see it has long lines between the manuscripts. This is what they call the Kufic script. We push that up a bit. And that's how you identify it, the long lines between the majuscules. This is, according to Muslims, the authentic or the original uh, Quranic script. The first thing you need to ask then is, are, are there any documents from the 7th century that have this script? We can't come across any that have been forensically tested. What can we do then? What do we do? Well, you need to go to some other use or some other means to look at uh, other objects that have this script. And one thing you can do, when you're in London, go to the British Museum and go up in the second floor and go up in the coin section and look at the uh, panel number 12. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures from the coins that are up on that panel. Because those coins give us a, an idea of the evolution of the Arabic script in the 7th century. Look at these coins here. These are the coins that were used at the very beginning of the Islamic era, or you might say during, not the Islamic era, they were used at the time of the Umayyad Caliph. This is the coins that were used from during the Sufyani period, from 660 to around 690. As you notice, they are basically Byzantine coins. They are borrowed from the Byzantine era. You can see figures uh, on the one side of the coin, on the back side of the coin actually used to be a cross, and there's the pedestal with the cross piece. The cross piece has been taken off. Now obviously, if you look at that, there's not a script from which we can look at. In 691, Abdul al-Malik came to power, who was a caliph at that time. He then decided to eradicate all these images of a people and puts only scripts on the coin. And at that time, he introduced these coins right here. These are the coins that were introduced during the Madwanid period, about 691. And they stayed and existed throughout the Umayyad period right up until 750, when the Abbasids took over. The Abbasids then took over Is uh, the, the, Islamic uh, the, the power of Islam and moved the capital from Damascus down to Baghdad. At that time, they introduced their own coinage. This is the coinage that you will see. If you can lift it up a little bit more, you can push it up. Look at the coinage on their coins from 750 on. What do you notice? Very ev evident right away. You see that that's the same type of script that we have on the Samarkand. And if you put the next one, it gives an example. Of this one. Yeah. You can see, if you look at the script and you look at a, a, a comparison between the coins and the Samarkand document, you will see it's the same script. <coughs> 
see that Kufic script. This Kufic script that we can come across is only first uh, used on coinage in 750. I've talked to Dr. Safadi, who is a, an expert in the Arabic script on the phone in London, and I asked him point blank, I said, the Samarkand manuscript and the, and the top copy, when would you date them? And he said, well, by looking at the script, you can see that these are probably 9th century documents. They are not 7th century. You can see that the style of writing, even the style of writing in the Samarkand and the top copy are much more stylized. When you pull it down, you make a comparison with that which is above it, you can see that the, 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 the script is different, completely different between these. Now, this over here is a script that was in existence in the 7th century. It's called the Ma'il script. It's a slanted script. Ma'il means slanted. It would, have been, it would be this script that would have been used if there had been any Quran in the 7th century. This Quran is actually comes from a Quran, and this Quran is now housed in the British Museum. You can go and see it for yourself. Dr. Martin Lynx, who is the curator for the British Museum, uh, was curator for the Manuscripts of the Museum, has dated this Quran to 790, late 8th century. And there are those who believe that this is the oldest manuscript of the Quran that we can put our hands on that has been forensically tested. Okay? So the problem that we're dealing with is that the, the Qurans that we do have, the oldest Quran that we do have, is the late 8th century. We don't have any Qurans from the 7th century that we can adequately say are from that period. There has not been any forensic test done yet. The, the, the Qurans that the Muslims have proposed as being 7th century Qurans are not from the 7th century. They're more likely from the 9th century. That's the first problem with manuscript evidence. Let's continue on. If you read the Quran, you can put that up here. Yeah. If you read the Quran, you will find that there's a lot of biblical stories, a lot of stories that deal with biblical characters that we have in our own Bible. About 70% I've been told of those stories. They deal with people that we know about as Christians. They deal with Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. They deal with Abraham, a lot of these people. But when you read the stories, they're not the stories that we've read. They're not the stories that I've grown up with. They're not the stories that I see in my Bible. They're quite different. Where do they come from? Well, here you have to do what we call a source analysis on these stories, and that's what we're doing. We're now looking for the sources of these stories. If they don't come from the Bible, what are they doing in the Quran? Where did they come from? And what we're doing is we're finding the sources for these stories. And it's very interesting where we're finding the sources are, where the sources are coming from for these stories. Let me give you an example. In Surah 5, Ayah 31, it talks about Cain and Abel. And it said, and in, in this story in, in Surah 5, it says that Cain had killed Abel and was looking how what he should do with the body. He sees a raven scratching in the ground, so therefore he decides to copy the raven and also and buries his brother in the ground as the raven did. Now that story is not in my Bible. Where did it come from? How did it get there? What we have found is this story <coughs> comes from the Targum of Jonathan ben Uzziah. In fact, it comes from three different Targums that were written in the second century AD, 200 years after Christ. Written not and did not exist at all in the canon of the, of the Jewish Bible or of the canon of the Christian Bible. It did not exist at all in those canons. They were written long after the canon had been made for the Jewish, for, for the Jewish Bible because the Jewish Torah and the, the, the Old Testament as we know it today was canonized in AD AD. These were written in the second century AD. But the next verse afterwards, Surah 5 verse 32, suddenly changes. And it talks about the salvation of one man is worthy of the salvation of, other, of, a, of every man. And the death of one man, or the punishment of one man, is worthy of the death of every man. I think, I don't know if I quoted it correctly on that. Now, what's that got to do with the story of Cain and Abel? What's it there? Why is it there? It almost seems like a redemptive story. It almost seems like a biblical passage, but yet there it is in the Quran. Why is it? This, is, this has bothered a number of people. We now know why it's there. Because in the Mishnah 4, verse 5, you see the exact same story as an editorial comment commenting about what Cain did to Abel. It's an editorial comment written by a man, a rabbi, in the second century, commenting about what happened when Cain killed Abel. Now, why is it that that story, plus the editorial comment, makes its way into the Quran in the 7th or 9th century? That's a problem. There's a difficulty there. Do you see what I'm talking about? It doesn't stop there. Let's take the story of Solomon and Sheba in Surah 21. I don't want to go into the whole story. You, many of you know the story. Solomon uses a, a, a messenger bird, the hoopoe bird, to go meet the Queen of Sheba, who then comes up after being invited to come and meet, me, uh, meet with Solomon. She comes up to the palace of Solomon, has never seen a mirrored uh, floor before, thinks it's water, pulls up her skirts, and so walks across. Solomon uh, cries out in surprise at seeing this. But this story is not in my Bible. Where does it come from? How is it there? We've gone back and we found almost the exact same story, almost word for word, <coughs> in the second target of Esther. Now, what are these targets? What are these missions? What are they? These are pieces of literature that were written after the diaspora, after the Jews had fled Jerusalem at the sacking of Jerusalem, when the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem. The Jews left and they fled out into Syria, into Jordan, into other parts of the, what we call the diaspora, and they took their rabbis with them. The rabbis had the Torah, but the Torah was written in Hebrew. 
these rabbis then would start would write down commentaries or their explanations of the Torah for the people there. And they would use the vernacular. They would use the language of the people around them. Therefore, these, these targums and these missions were written in the vernacular, some of which would also have been written in Arabic, and also for the Byzantine world, and also for the Sassanid world. In, in, in um, uh, not Farsi, um, I can't think of the can't think of the, of the name of the language, the language right there off the top. But it's like it's what's what we would call Farsi today. Now, fascinating, it's these stories then that would have been in existence, these stories would have been uh, easily adapted, and it would be these stories that were then borrowed and put into the Quran. Why is it that they didn't go back to the authentic article? Why didn't they go back to the Bible and copy the stories from the scriptures? For one very good reason. <coughs> the Bible had not been translated into Arabic until the 8th century. Can you see why now it was these stories they adopted and not the, the authentic article? Now that is a problem now that I, we lay with the Muslims because they've got to come up and answer these problems of the source criticism. Looking at the sources, and there's many stories that I, the story of Abraham in Surah, I'm sorry, the story of Abraham is in Surah 21, and the story of uh, uh, Solomon Chief is in Surah, is in surah 20, uh, 20, 27. But the story of Abraham, we now have been able to find the source for that story, and it comes from the Talmud of, the, 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 the of Rabbah. But interestingly, it comes from one mistranslation of one word. It's again another editorial comment, a mistranslation of one word, the word Ur. Abraham came from the Ur of the Chaldees. The, the, in the second century, one commentator thought the Ur meant fire because it's very similar to the word for light in Hebrew. And from that time on, everybody after him wrote that Abraham was in the fire, came out of the fire. Now that story finds its way into the Quran. Why is it that they didn't go back to the authentic article? They didn't have the vernacular. They didn't have the authentic article in their hands. That's some of the manuscript problems that we're dealing with the Quran. What about the Bible? Because the same question could be asked of the Bible, and people are asking that. They're saying, "Wait a minute, Mr. Smith, does not do you not also have difficulties with your scriptures? You don't have any of the originals as well. You you say we have a gap of 150 years. What about the Bible? How much of a gap is there? Mm. Not quite yet. This is what you have to tell him when to put it wrong, when not. He's so eager. <laughs> if you look at the Bible, uh, the, the documents that we have, or the manuscripts we have for the scriptures, you will find, first of all, that we're, you, need, you need to be careful that you do not compare, you make the same comparative, because we're talking about totally different centuries. We're talking about the first century versus the seventh to ninth century. Therefore, you're talking about apples and oranges. In the first century, there was no paper, there were no documents that, that we can put our hands on. They were dependent on papyrus. These are ladies that are interlocked together. Papyrus disintegrates by virtue of its very, uh, by a definition, it disintegrates. We would not expect to find documents or manuscripts from the originals in the first century. The interesting thing is, we are finding them. We're finding fragments from these documents. Now that's fascinating. In fact, there's one right down here in Oxford, and you can go down there, the, what they call the Jesus Papyrus, the model and manuscript. And there's been a great book written by Dr. Carson Thiebe that just came out two years ago, de describing how forensically he has gone back to using script analysis and amalgamating and finding four other manuscripts which are of like script, been able to date it to around 68, 58 to 68 AD. That means within 20 years of Christ's death, we already have the first documentation of the Matthew 26 account. Now, if we can go back to the first century and come up with documents, we not only have that, and if you put it up, if you put that down there, I'm just going to show you this. What is very important is when people criticize the manuscript evidence we have from the Bible, they need to use, they need to look at the statistics, and they need to uh, use a comparison. Let's put this up just a bit. Just look at this here. Take these secular manuscripts: Herodotus, Thucydides, Aristotle, Caesar, Pliny, Suetonius, Tacitus. We know all these people; these are historians. Nobody doubts the authenticity of their writings. But look when they wrote. They wrote from 480 BC all the way up to 180. Now look, what the, what, look at the dates of the first copies we have from their writings. The earliest copy we have for, for, for uh, these are from 900 to 1000 AD. We don't have anything from before 850 AD for any of these writers. Yet nobody doubts their authenticity. Now look at the Bible. Come down right down here. The model of manuscript. The first century, the first copy we have is between 50 to 68 AD. John Wiley's Institute up here in Manchester, we have one of, of the, the book of John, 90 AD, 130 AD is dated. Can you see the difference? All of these were written long before the, the first, where the copies were, 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 that, that we have in our hands are long before we see any secular writings. What we're saying is that for the Bible, we have more manuscript evidence for the Bible than any other book, be it secular or religious. Just look at the statistics. How, what, what how, number are we talking about? If you're talking before the 6th century, we can come up with 230 fragments or manuscripts of the New Testament alone before the 6th century. Now, why is it that Islam cannot even come up with one until the late 8th century for their Quran? That's the question we're asking. All right? But just, let's just add up with the, the nine inches we do have. The more we have, the more we know of what, what's going on. We have 5,300 Greek manuscripts in the New Testament. Another 9,000 
other uh, translation, we have 10,000 Latin Vulgates. If you add them all up together, that gives us 24,000 manuscripts for our New Testament alone. Do you see what we're dealing with? Now, people say we've corrupted our scriptures. Let me continue on with what, well, what, what other things that we do have for our scriptures. Not only do we have these uh, manuscripts, we have 15,000 translations of the Bible written in eight languages. Let me just lay, lay them off to you. Latin, Syriac, Syria, Coptic, Armenian, Gothic, Nubian, Georgian, Ethiopian. If we had wanted to corrupt our scriptures, we would have had to gone back to every one of those translations and change them. All of those 15,000 we would have had to change. We have another 1,500 lectionaries from the, from, from the 6th century on. We would have had to change all of those if we wanted to, if we, if we wanted to corrupt our scriptures. <laughs> you see the difficulty we're dealing with? We wouldn't expect to find originals before the 4th century because people were not invented until the 4th century. From the 4th century on, there's an enormous amount of documentation. We have two Bibles alone that are from the 4th and 5th century right here in the British Museum if you want to go see them for yourself, the Sinaiticus and the Alexandrinus. Don't trust me. Go and find out for yourself what's in existence. But what's even more so than that? We've got the early church fathers. Now, the early church fathers from the very beginning were writing, were quoting from the scriptures. They quote from all 27 of the New Testament writings. These are men like Clement, who is, who is, who is uh, uh, writing it from between 30 and 95 AD. Ignatius, Polycarp. These are men like Justin, Irenaeus. These are all the early church fathers. They quoted right, left, and center from the scriptures. There's been a study done by a man named Dalrymple. He's put together and found out 86,000 quotes of the New Testament just in their letters alone. They've gone down there and they put it down and they said, well, how, what about how many quotes can we find from before the, the Council of Nicaea from the New Testament? They have found every one of the 27 books of the, of the canonized New Testament within their letters. They've amalgamated, put them together, and before 325 AD, in other words, before the Council of Nicaea, they have been able to amass and put together the entire New Testament except for 11 verse. That means we could throw away all those 24,000 manuscripts. We could throw away those 15,000 translations and just go to the early church fathers and reproduce the entire New Testament just by looking at their letters except for 11 verses. Now, if that's not authority for manuscript authority, I don't know what is. But can you see the comparison of what we're saying? Compare and look at the mass amount of manuscript evidence we have for our Bible versus what Islam has for theirs. We don't see the Quran in existence. We don't see manuscript. And then also we see a huge flourishing of manuscript evidence from the late 8th century to 9th century on during the opposite area. Why is it that we can come up with so much in the very from the very first century on? Now let's continue on with documentary evidence. What do we know about documentary evidence? I can see I'm going to keep moving on. So let me just jump uh, ahead to the problem of Mecca. Some of you know what I'm going to say, some of you have heard me say it before, others of you I can see a few of us familiar faces here from London. Mecca has become a real problem for uh, Orientalists, it's become a, very pro a lot of problems for, for Muslims. Why do I say that? What do we know about Mecca? Well, what Islam tells us is Mecca is one of the oldest cities in the world. According to some traditions, it's where Adam and Eve were sent to when they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. It's where Abraham and Ishmael rebuilt the Kaaba. Therefore, it's one of the oldest cities. We should see lots of documentation about the city called Mecca. We also know, according to what uh, history tells us, that uh, according to Islamic tradition history, that it's where there was a center of trade between Gaza in the north and Aden in the south. Between in, uh, looking over here in the west, you, you had uh, the Ethiopians in the west and also India and China in the east that were traded with the uh, Mediterranean world in the, in, in the west. Now, if this was so, we should see lots of documentation about the city of, of Mecca. There's a lady named Dr. Patricia Crone, who is, uh, was a teacher, was a professor at Oxford. She then moved to Cambridge, was head of department there. And now she's just now moved, uh, as of last uh, October, to uh, Princeton in New Jersey. And she wrote a book in 1987 called Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam. Fascinating book. I'd recommend to anybody to read. What she did is she said, let's look at Mecca. And let's see whether or not we can corroborate Mecca with history. Can we find any account of this place called Mecca in historical books? She went back to the early historical writers. She went back to men like Hosmus, Theodoretus. She went back to men like uh, Procopius. These are men, these are historians, Byzantine, Greek historians, who are writing in the 4th, 5th, and 6th century. She looked at their writings. Nowhere was there any mention of a place called Mecca in any of these writings. She said, fine, let's go back to the trading documents between the Greek world and the Indian subcontinents. Let's find out what, if there's any mention of this place called Mecca. They cannot find any mention of a place called Mecca in any of these documents. What she did find was very interesting. She said, by looking at these trade documents, by looking at the historians, that the trade that was happening between the Mediterranean and the India and China never went through a place called Mecca, never even went through Arabia, for one very good reason. It was a maritime trade. From the first century on, it was totally maritime. And if you look at a map, you'll see why. Because the trade was being shipped on, the, uh, put on board ships on the west coast of India, went across the Indian Ocean. Why would they then transship and put it down on, on, on land and go 1,250 miles from Gaza up to the north, I mean, from Aden up to Gaza, 1,250 miles, when they had a waterway that went right up the west coast called the Red Sea? What she found is that's exactly what they did. 
When she looked at the documents, she found out that, these do that these, this trade was not controlled at all by any Arabs. They were controlled by the Ethiopians. Adulis is the name that comes up. That's the capital city of Ethiopia, what is today Eritrea. That's the name that comes up in all the documents. <coughs> she went also and, went and, and, and discovered some documents that came out of um, Iran, where they went, and they went to a place called Yathrib. You know what Yathrib is? It's the ancient name from Medina. She found that there were silver mines there. They didn't even mention a place called Mecca. In fact, she can't find any place that mentions Mecca until 724 AD. Not until 724 AD is she, did she find the first mention of a place called Mecca. Muhammad died in 632. Do you see the significance? Because if you don't have Mecca, you don't have the sanctuary. If you don't have the sanctuary, you don't have the prophet. If you don't have the prophet, what do you do with the Quran? Obviously, this is devastating. This is, there's an enormous amount of significance of what I'm saying here. Not everybody's going to accept it. I imagine most Muslims won't accept it. What I'm saying is look at what history is telling us. Don't just say that the traditions tell us this and that. Look and understand where those traditions were written. When were the traditions written? Everything we know about Mecca, everything we know about Muhammad in Mecca and Medina, where do they come from? They come from men like Ibn Ishaq. They come from men like Ibn Hisham. Men like Ibn al-Bukhari, al-Tabari. Where were these men? When did they write? They did not write in the 7th century. They did not write in the 8th century. Ishaq did write in the 8th century, but we don't have any of his documents. We have to go to Ibn Hisham to find out what Ibn Ishaq said. They wrote in the 9th and 10th century. They did not write in Arabia. All their names are basically Farsi names. They come from the opposite period. They come from places like the Baghdad in Iraq. In Iraq and Iran, what is Iraq and Iran today? They were not even living in that area, nor did they ever know the Prophet. Now, do you understand why this is significant? Every, all the stories we're hearing are not from that time period. They're from two to three hundred years later. That is significant. That's why we're asking these questions. Can they be trusted? That's a whole other. That's a whole other lecture. Maybe Shabi Ali and I can have another debate on the traditions. That's not for today. Let's go on then. What about the documentary evidence for the Bible? Can we not say the same exists for the Bible? Do we not? Do we have any documentary evidence to support what we see in the Bible? When you look at the Bible, you need to ask. And the historians have been doing this. They've been saying, listen, there's, um, not just me, but everybody. There, there are difficulties with the Bible. We don't know whether or not the Hittites, these people called the Hittites, exist. It's imaginary. We don't know of these cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. They're just imaginary. There's no recorded documentation of cities called Sodom and Gomorrah from the 6th century on. I'm sorry, from the 12th century on. We don't have any. In fact, there was no documentation. There's a lot of speculation whether or not this is just imaginary. That is until they came across the Ebla tablets and the Amarna tablets. The Amarna tablets were found in Egypt. The Ebla tablets were found in Syria. The Marmi tablets were found in Euphrates. The Nuzi tablets were found in what is today Iraq. These are tablets that don't disintegrate. These are tablets that are found under mounds, under cities. When they started deciphering and started interpreting and started translating these tablets, they found some interesting things. They found out that these tablets come from, a, from a parts of the world that were, that were in existence before the time of the patriarchs, before the time of Abraham. Many people doubted whether Moses could have written because there was no writing at that time. Suddenly they found tablets that were dated to 2300 BC. When did Moses live? He lived in 1400 BC. Long, almost, almost a thousand years before they were writing. And what do these tablets say? It's what they say that's very interesting. Because when you read these tablets, you will find that they deal with the same customs, the same rules, the same ideas, many, many of the same cultural identities that was happening during the patriarchal time, what we see in the Genesis account. They talk about the six customs that Abraham fulfilled when he was there in uh, coming, coming down to Canaan. There we see in the Genesis account, we see these in the Nuzi tablets. But what's interesting are the Evla tablets. 17,000 tablets that were discovered in Tel Marti. When they deciphered these tablets, they start looking and they start finding names, places. Remember I talked, it's very important we find places, events, and people. In one tablet, it talked about five cities. The cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. Now what are these five cities? These are the five cities we see Abraham defending, uh, challenging against in, in Genesis. Um, what's the, uh, the, the, Genesis 14, 8? Genesis 14.8, the exact same five cities that we see in Genesis 14.8 in the same order that we see in Genesis 14.8. Now, these were written in 2300 B.C. Moses wrote in 1400 B.C. People said Sodom and Gomorrah never existed. Why is it they never existed in any later documentary? We know, if you read the Bible, it tells you very simply. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were destroyed from the face of the earth. The angel of the Lord came down and destroyed them right there in Genesis 14. No wonder there was no documentation at that time of these two cities. No wonder the historians thought that they were fantastical. If they'd only gone to the Bible, they would have realized the Bible is historically correct. But what's even more interesting, it showed that whoever wrote the Genesis account had to have written from before or around the time 1400 BC and not from the 6th century. Because that was destroyed in the 1400 BC. The Ebla tablets delineate that from 2300 BC that these cities exist and that they were trading cities. Now that gives me an awful lot of confidence for my Bible. Because I now know that the Bible could not have been written in the 6th century and had to have been written from at least from the 14th century or earlier. Thank the Lord for that. That's the documentary we're dealing with. Now let's go on to the archaeological evidence because this is really where the rubber hits the road. 
This is probably the most devastating evidence that we have, not only for the Bible, but against the Quran. And I say that because as a historian, it's important. As a historian, you've got to deal with this, you've got to deal with history, you've got to deal with the evidence that's there. What does it tell us? Let's start with the Quran at first. The Qibla is, uh, is, was instituted, we know that the Qibla was delineated, or you might say changed, according to Surah 2, uh, Ayah 145 to 150, from Jerusalem down to Mecca. This is according to, I, it, there's, there's a, uh, not a consensus as to exactly what year that happened. Most people believe it happened two years after the Hijjah. The Hijjah was in 622, so let's say 624. What that means is that any mosque or any uh, artifact or any building that we see that claims to be a mosque should have a Qibla directed towards Mecca after 624. There's a man named Dr. Creswell who has done the standard work on early Islamic architecture in the, the turn of the century, beginning of the century, and he has gone to mosques in the Iraq area. He's gone to the Wasit Mosque in Iraq, also the Kufa Mosque in the Iraq. These are mosques that have been built and destroyed, built and destroyed. And he's gone down to the original floor plans, also the Fustat Mosque, the Garrison Mosque, outside of Cairo in Egypt, and has looked at the original floor plans. And what he has found is very interesting. He has found that the Qiblas in these mosques are not facing towards Mecca. The Kufa Mosque and the Wasit Mosque are 33 to 30 degrees off. Why? These, were built, these were mosques were built in the late 7th century. They should be facing Mecca. That None of them are facing Mecca. In fact, we can't find any mosques in the 7th century that we've been able to put our hands on, that we can go and investigate, that we can actually go and try to do some diggings on. No mosques are facing Mecca. Now, what's going on here? Where are they facing? Well, if you had a map, you would see that they're facing probably North Arabia or possibly even at Jerusalem. We don't know. What's in Jerusalem? There's the Dome of the Rock in the uh, Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. All the Muslims know it's your third most holy shrine. What is it significant for? When, you, when I talk to my Muslim friends, what they tell me is that the Dome of the Rock that Muhammad went up to heaven during the Mi'raj, therefore it's a very significant place. But have anybody looked at the Dome of the Rock? Have, I've been to the Dome of the Rock. I've been inside. It's a very beautiful place. But one of the things that you will find about the Dome of the Rock, it has no qibla. There's no qibla in the Dome of the Rock. Why would it not have a qibla? It should have a qibla. It was built in 691 by Abdul al-Malik. It should have a qibla. It's built in an octagonal shape. Now, why would you build an octagonal shaped building? There's only one reason to build an octagonal shaped building, and that's for circumambulation, for doing circles around. Was this the original sanctuary? We don't know. But it's significant that this building, a mall building, is the direction where these kibbles are facing, up until at least as late as 705. We have a document from Jacob of Odessa who notes in 705, while he was in Cairo, that the, Ar the Arabs, the Maghreds, were all facing the same direction as the Christians at that time. The Christians were facing towards Jerusalem at that time. That's significant. Let's continue on. Let's then go to the inscriptions, Leva's inscriptions. When you ask about the early Islamic history, you need to ask as to what was happening in the 7th century. You need to ask as to what was being written about these people. What were the people themselves writing? Remember I said that all that we can refer to are the Muslim traditions. We have to go to the Muslim traditions to find out what was going on in the time of, of, uh, of the Prophet, in the time that, uh, of the Rashidun, the rightly guided caliphs, in the time of the, of the, uh, the Umayyad caliph, when it began in 660, all the way up through to, to 750. The history that we do find there is very significant. Because the history we do find was not written from that time period, it is written from much, much later. Written from the 8th, the 9th, and, and ninth, mainly the 9th and 10th century. Bukhari died in 870. Uh, Al-Tabri, the Tafsir, the Tahrir, that he's credited with. He died in 923, so that's early 10th century. But Hisham, who was credited with the Siddha of the Prophet, he died in 833. So 200 to 300 years later, <coughs> can we trust it? Should we trust it? And why don't we go back to the 7th century and see what the 7th century is telling us? Well, there is a man named Dr. Yehuda Neville who has done that. He's gone back to the Negev Desert. He's gone back to the Syrian desert. He's gone back to the Jordanian desert. And he's found thousands of, I, I should say, I should say thousands, but certainly hundreds of inscriptions written in Arabic, written by the first, supposedly the first Muslims, certainly by the first Arabs who were at this time. Some of them even have a name of Muawiyah, who was the first, as you know, those Muslims who were present. He was the first Umayyad Caliph. Uh, Taif, uh, uh, inscription on a, on, a, on a dam in Taif that was written. This is a religious inscription. When he started deciphering these Arab, uh, Arab inscriptions, he found some very interesting things. These should be full of names. They should be full of re references to Muhammad. It's full of references to the Quran. Full of references to Muslims and to Islam and to what was happening there. Yet they say nothing about that. They say nothing about that. What he found is there was no mention of a man named Muhammad in these inscriptions. There's no mention of a people called Muslims or a religion called Islam. But there's no mention of a book called the Quran. In fact, what he did find is that the first time we hear mention what we call the Mohammedan formula, that Allah is one and Muhammad is his prophet, the first time we see that mention is on the Dome of the Rock. 
and some Sussex coins that were coined about the same time, 690, 691. That's a whole 60 years later. We don't have any that we can come across, <laughs> that we can delineate and uh, forensically identify, uh, <laughs> mention in these inscriptions of uh, what we should expect to be full of and replete of Muslim ident identification, because these were the first Muslims. They should have been full, they should be re resounding with this type of inscription. What he did also found is that when you look at these inscriptions, you will see that the Mohammedan Formula One, it was introduced then in 691, it was almost like it was introduced overnight. And from that time on, all the protocols, all the caliphal protocols, then refer to Muhammad as a prophet. But it happened in one period, and it happened during the Marwanian period. Why not before? That's a problem. Let's now ask the same thing. What's the archaeological evidence that we have for the Bible? Is it accurate? Now, I said, and I started at the very beginning, that I want to talk about people's places and events. But what I want to do is I want to show you what kind of uh, evidence we have, archaeological evidence we have, for our people, for our places and for our events. It's, it's not up on this on the screen yet, so you can turn that off for now. <coughs> what do we have? Shishak, the Egyptian king who plundered the temple during the reign of Rehoboam. He is mentioned in tablets. We also find that Jehu, the king of Israel, who took power in the bloody coup, only surviving likeness of a king of Israel, Judah. You can find that right here in the British Museum. There's a, there's a, there is a pillar there that mentions his name. In the same time period that we see from 2 Kings 9, Hazael, king of Aram, any of Israel, Tiglath Pelezer, the third king of Assyria, Sargon II, king of Assyria. Tiglath Pelezer, you can see a chariot right here in the British Museum that refers to him in the same time period that we see the Bible referring to him. Sargon II, king of Assyria. Sennacherib, king of Assyria. <coughs> Tirka, king of Egypt. These are all found in the British Museum. You can go see them for yourself. They're all right there. It's fascinating. We have them right here locally, if you, if you don't trust what I'm saying today. Eshahadad, king of Assyria. Also Merodach, Palad, Balad, and king of Babylon. These are all people that are, that are mentioned in 1st and 2nd Kings. They're also mentioned, some of them, in Isaiah and also in the 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Yet all of them have been corroborated and substantiated by history. We've got them right here in our, locally. We can even go down, just down the road to see them. Xerxes, the one, the king of Persia, who allowed the returning of Exodus to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, is also found there. In fact, what they have done is they have found 50 different um, Old Testament people that are mentioned in the Bible. 50 of them have now been substantiated and corroborated by secular historical documentation. Archaeological, I'm sorry, documentation. Now that's fascinating. In the New Testament, we can find the same thing. Augustus, the Roman Emperor, Tiberius, Claudius. These are people that you would expect to find because they were, of course, what world-renowned people. Herod Agrippa, he was the king of the Jews at that time, ruler of Judea, I'm sorry, uh, who persecuted the early church in Acts 12. Uh, Aretas, the fourth, king of Nevations, and Nero, of course, as we know, the infamous king who, who played a fiddle while uh, Rome was burning. We can find 27 New Testament characters people in the New Testament that have been now attested and corroborated and verified by historical archaeological studies. Fascinating. What about places? Ten minutes already. The Tower of Babel in Babylon. The base of the Tower of Babel in Babylon we've now found. Uh, uh, this is the Tower of Babel where the, the, the languages were confused. In fact, let me just go to something else in the Tower of Babel. We've also found that Sumerian tablets refer not only about this tower, but they refer to the fact that before the tower was built, people lived a lot longer. After the tower was built, people lived a lot shorter. That's exactly what we see in Genesis 11. The Babylonians also talked about that the Tower of Babel, because at the top of the God destroyed the Temple of Tower. That he scattered their people and made their speech strange. Exactly what we see in Genesis 11. So we even have secular accounts which speak of the same things that happened that we see in Genesis 11. All right? Very important. What are the things that we found? We found the Palace of Jericho, and I'm going to say a little bit more about the Palace of Jericho when we talk about events, because it's very significant. Where Eglon, king of Moab, was assassinated by Ehud. We found the East Gate of Sechem, where Gael and Zebul had watched the forces of Abimelech approaching the city. They've also found the Temple of Baal, El Bereth, in Shechem, and the Pool of Gibeon, where the forces of David and Ishbosheth fought during the struggle of the kings of Israel in 2 Samuel. They've also found the Pool of Heshbon, like to the eyes of the Shelomite woman, the royal palace of Samaria, where the kings of Israel lived. They've also found the pool of Samaria, where King Ahab's chariot was washed after his death. The water tunnel beneath Jerusalem, I've been in that water tunnel, I've walked through it. That has not been discovered, it was just discovered in the last 20 years. The royal palace of Babylon, where King Belshazzar held a feast with Daniel, <coughs> and where Daniel interpreted the handwriting. These have all been found now, have been substantiated, and have corroborated what we see in the biblical account. The Murnat uh, Stella is very interesting. This is a stella that, has, that was now found. It's dated to 1210 BC. It's about the time of Gideon in Judges 6, for those of you who, who know your Bible. At the bottom of the stella is a poem, and it says this, 
Israel is laid waste. Its seeds is not. Israel is laid waste. This is the first time, this is the oldest account in any inscription or any type of documentation of this, the people of Israel. This is the first time we see any mention of the people of Israel dated 1210 BC. This is about the exact same time, interestingly, that David Roll, I don't know if you've seen his, if you've seen his book, it's right there, if you just had to look it up the test of time. David Roll has come out with in the last two years, where he is now redating, using the king's list in Thebes, and has redated and found out that we've been off on our dating by about 200 years. And if now that he's got the dating back in order, we now have this Marte it now makes sense what the Marnapta Stella is telling us. It's referring to the fact that the people were in existence, they were already as a people in the 1200 BC. What David was, uh, what David Roll is saying is this, the, the, the Israelites first came into the land around 1400 BC, 14th century, now eradicating a lot of the criticism that has been put on the dates of, uh, of the Mosaic experience and Exodic experience, but also substantiating what we now see, because what we have found is if you put the, uh, Moses back into the 14th century, what you find is we now found the, 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 for, the forbidden city, not the forbidden city, the city where the Israelites lived, abandoned overnight. We've also found the death pits where the, where the thousands of Egyptians were died on the, on the 10th plague. That has now been found. Now these are things that, that we, would, we knew they existed there, but we had the wrong dates for them. Now that we have substantiated the dates, they all fit into place. Again, supporting what we see in the biblical text. Using secular archaeological data. Using historical evidence. In this case, archaeological evidence. The royal palace of Babylon, where King Belshazzar held the feast of Daniel, has now also been found. So has the royal palace in Susa. The royal gate at Susa, where Mordecai, Esther's cousin, sat, has now also been found. The square in front of the royal gate in Susa, also where Mordecai sat, was, has now been found. So all of these are being finding in just a matter of time before we find more and more. If you look at, if you go through places like Mesopotamia, if you go through places like Turkey today, you will see mounds. I've been through there, and I've seen the mounds that are there. These are cities, and cities that are built upon cities. Just a matter of time of digging down and looking down and pulling out and excavating. We need more time to do that to corroborate what the biblical account is saying. What it tells me is that the biblical account, when it touches history, it can be substantiated in time by that which we're finding out. The foundation of the synagogue of Capernaum, where Jesus cured a man with unclean spirit, has now been found. The house of Peter in Capernaum also has been found. So has Jacob's well, where Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman in John 4. The pool of Bethesda was just found in the last few years, in fact, in Jerusalem. The Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem, where Jesus healed the blind man, has also now been found. So is the tribunal, tribunal at Corinth, where Paul uh, was tried. The theater in Ephesus, I've been there, I've seen it. It's right, it's, it's right just uh, a little away from I uh, Izmir, where my sister lives. This has now been found, this is where they, uh, uh, Paul almost started a riot of silversmiths. Herod's palace at Caesarea, where Paul was, was kept under guard, has also now been found. What we're saying is the places that we're talking about in the Bible, they are now being substantiated. They're now being corroborated by historical evidence. Now that's important for me, because if I can see that the Bible does, when it touches history, does talk accurately, when it is credible, when it can be verified, then I can trust what the Bible has to say. But first of all, I've got to pass that first turn. Thank you. Now what about the events? Let's look at some of the events. Let's look at the flood. Many historians say the flood is fantastical, it didn't, it didn't exist. Now here's where we would be co-religion with you Muslims, because Muslims also have a, a view of the flood. What is substantiation for the flood? What do we know about the flood? Is it fantasy? Did it not happen? What they have found is that they've gone around the world and looked at the customs that are coming out of different cultures. They have found, for instance, the Sumerian king's list. Talks about the fact that the people, I, I already mentioned this before, what they have found that there have been uh, over 138 records now of flood accounts that have been found in every culture but the Egyptian culture. Every culture but the Egyptian culture, now they have been able to substantiate and find accounts of the flood. Now, people might say, well then, were these all made up? The fact that it is found from as far away as China to the Philippines, all as far away as native Indians in the United States, the fact that it covers every culture around the world, the fact that it is so comprehensive, to me suggests that it did happen. I would expect then these people to have adopted and maintained these accounts. Jericho. The Germans went back to Jericho in, in 1907 and 1909, and, and as they were digging down to the ground, from the, the, as it went dug down in the uh, uh, foundations, they found a lot of mud bricks around, around the, the bottom of the foundation. They didn't know what these mud bricks were for. In 1950, the, the very famous uh, archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon went back, and she went, into these, uh, went back to these mud bricks and discovered almost immediately what they were for. She found that these were mud bricks were part of the original walls of Jericho. But interestingly, they were outside the city and not inside. If a city's walls are going to be destroyed, they always implode. They always come in. They don't fall outward. But physics tells us that. Why would these? Why would these buildings? Why would these bricks fall? Uh, why would? How, how, uh, why had they fallen outward? It's very simple. The Bible tells us why. 
God had made it so for one very good reason. So that when they did fall outwards, then the Israelites can go right up over the walls, go right up over the rubble, and attack the people inside. She went inside and she found out that there was fire. Almost all the buildings had been destroyed by fire. Even the bricks had been destroyed by fire. It was so intense. But she found one very significant, interesting fact that, this, that, that this still does not account, and that is that the northern wall was completely intact. Now, why was the northern wall intact? I can tell you the reason. You need to, you need to go look to Joshua 2, for, uh, verse 15. This is in 1400 B.C. Joshua 2 says it right away. There was one woman there called Rahab. She helped the spies, the Israelite spies. God then said to her that she would be spared. Her, her uh, house was built on the northern wall. The reason that the northern wall was not destroyed is because God was saving the life of Rahab. Now that we know from the scriptures, 1400 B.C. it happened. It took to the 1950s, just 30 years ago, to substantiate that using modern forensic archaeological evidence. She found that. She did not understand it. We give her the reason why the Bible says so. It's these type of records that we're talking about. But it's even more. Let's talk about the New Testament. How much more time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes, thank you. When you look at the New Testament, you need to look, you need to go to the man called Luke. You need to go to his writings. You need to go to the Acts of the Apostle. Because Luke, above all more than anybody else, is our historian. He wrote about people's places and events. He was a, a doctor. And when you read his accounts, you will find that there's lots of places that can be corroborated. There have been a lot of historians that have, that, that have disputed what he used. They said that he should not have used the name Polytarch in uh, Acts 17, because this was not known as a civil authority. He used it referring to Thessalonica. Since then, there have been 19 inscriptions that have been found that all use the name Polytarch, five of them referring to a Polytarch in Thessalonica, corroborating what Luke had said. Praetor was another new name he, he used, a Philippian ruler. The historian said that according to Roman uh, wordage, he should have used the word Dumir. Now they have found that there are inscriptions that refer to the fact that the Romans earlier used Praetor. So therefore, therefore whoever had, uh, came up with the word Dumir was much later. And, that, and no wonder it was, not, it was not a person who was uh, an eyewitness to the account. But probably the best proof text we have is the name for, that he gives for um, Gallio. He says in Acts 18.12 that Gallio was the proconsul. Now, Pliny writing 60 or 70 years later, never refers to Galilee. He talks about Galilee, but he never refers to him as a proconsul. Many historians thought, aha, Luke's got it wrong here. The Acts accounts are wrong. It must have been written in the 2nd century. That is until they came across the Adelphi inscription just about 15 years ago. When they read the Adelphi inscription, they read that Galio was a proconsul for one year and one year alone in 52 AD. Now, what does that tell you? That tells me a number of things, two things specifically. First of all, that whoever wrote the book of Acts got it right. Whoever wrote the book of Acts had to be an eyewitness to the event. Whoever wrote the book of Acts had to been writing in or, in or around 52 AD because it only happened for one year. No wonder Pliny got it wrong. He was not an eyewitness to the account. But that tells me that the book of Acts was not written in the second century. It was written possibly around 52 AD. Now that substantiates what I'm talking about. It's that very thing that we're asking the Muslims to do. It's the very thing that, ha that has been thrown upon us for the last hundred years. Historical criticism, okay, I'll leave it this one last sentence. Historical criticism is something both Muslims and Christians need to do. It's something that we both need to be engaged in. I thank you for the time you've given me today.
God speaks through which book? Is it the Bible or is it the Quran? <coughs> now the answer may be either, it may be neither, or it may be both. Before we answer that question, let me find out uh, how our audience is composed. Can I see by a show of hands how many Muslims we have in the audience? Overwhelming majority. Can I find out how many Christians we have in the audience? Well, might is not always right, you know. Can I find out how many atheists we have in the audience? We do have one. And as we do say, might is not always right. Now, I will speak today to the overwhelming majority of our audience here, which is 99.9%, the, the group comprising of both Muslims and Christians. Now, for Muslims and Christians answering this question, we are starting from a faith perspective. Some of you are committed to the Quran, some of you are committed to uh, the Bible. I don't mean to exclude our friend, uh, but I expect that the, some of what we'll be sharing with you will be convincing also to a person who is starting from an atheist or a secular humanist point of view, because we'll be using reason, logic, and good evidence to support what we believe in. Now, let's get to answering the question then. Which book is the Word of God, and which is God speaking to us? Is it the Bible or the Quran? Both, neither, or either one? I have a couple of tapes here from the last debate that Smith and I had, had back in Manchester in April of last year. I'd like to offer a copy of these tapes to Smith. <laughs> now, also, before I, I go further into answering the question for you, I have with me a paper which I believe was written by uh, Joseph Smith, uh, entitled, Is the Quran uh, the Word of God? That is your paper, it looks like yours. Now, somewhere in the... Uh, well, I have to ask because it doesn't bear his name, you see, and it was given to me by someone. I just want to make sure it is recognizable. Hmm? Yeah. And it talks about your debate with Dr. Batty and all of that. Now, somewhere in here, you quote three words from Michael Cook's book, 1983 edition, page 68. Three words showing that uh, in the Quran there are some things which look like gross scientific flaws. Can you do me a favor and find that in here because I couldn't find it myself? Give me a buzz when you have it. <laughs> now, folks, often when we're dealing with uh, things so complex as archaeological evidence, documentary hypotheses, and source analysis, uh, we common folks have to rely on, on what scholars tell us because we have not been there uh, we have not seen the evidence and we're relying on the scholarly authorities. What I'd like to do is for whatever ev evidence I show you, I would rely on authorities who are recognized authorities on the field, otherwise I will not quote them. The rest of the time I'll be showing you evidence which you can check for yourself and you can verify on your own just using the books which are there in front of you. So let's answer that question. Now, for many Christians, the answer to our question will be, the Bible alone. My answer would be the Quran and the Bible. As a Muslim, I do believe that God speaks to us both, or God has spoken, both in the Bible and in the Quran. Let me begin by showing some evidence for why I believe that God speaks through the Quran. I believe that there are six categories of evidence which would be relevant to our discussion today. One, that the Quran mentions things from the past which was not known at the time that the Quran was composed, and later independent investigations prove that the Quran was right all along. Two, the Quran speaks about the future, which could not have been known at the time the Quran was composed, and then later findings show that the Quran was right all along. Three, the Quran mentions certain things describing physical phenomena, certain aspects which modern scientists are now discovering with the use of their modern equipment and uh, these show that the Quran has been right all along. So these are good evidence to show that the Quran could not have been composed by any human being. Four, there, are lack, there is a complete lack of errors in the Quran and we know that a book composed by any human being regardless when uh, is always prone to error. Even our modern science textbooks would have some kind of 
uh, disclaimer in the, in the preface saying if you find any errors in here, please let us know so we can correct future editions. No such thing in the Quran, no error has been found, despite the fact that many people have wasted their efforts trying to dwell on some uh, point of pivot or another. And five, the Quran challenges people to produce something like this book. If you think that this book was produced by a human being, why don't you produce one to match this book, something similar to it, and that will prove that at least it can be done. You still wouldn't prove that the Quran wasn't from God, but at least you will raise considerable doubt by showing that it can be done by a human being. And six, the previous records, which were written long before the Quran, believed by certain adherents to those records, uh, actually prophesy the coming of the Prophet Muhammad and, of course, the Quran that comes with him as a message from God. This last point will be relevant mostly to the people who believe in those scriptures, and I would mention specifically prophecies from the Bible. Now let's look at some of the evidence. Let's go to, um, uh, well, before we go to the slides, let me just mention briefly what we will discover uh, by looking at some of these evidences. I said that the Quran speaks about modern science, and then modern science uh, verifies that the Quran was right all along. One of the modern discoveries is that everything was created from water, and indeed the Quran already said that in Surah 24, ayah number 45. Also in Surah 21, ayah number 30. The Quran tells us that the heavens and the earth were created simultaneously from a single gaseous mass, reading Surah 21.30 and uh, Surah 41.11. And uh, this exactly ties in with what modern scientists do tell us. In the field of astronomy, we find that the Quran describes that the heavens are supported without any visible support. And indeed, what holds up the heavens is not any visible support, but the forces which God has placed therein. One of the most imposing discoveries of modern science is that the universe is expanding, and the Quran in Surah 51.47 has already stated that fact. The Quran mentions the feasibility of space explorations in Surah 55, number 33. The fact that day and night occur simultaneously because our Earth is not flat is mentioned in the Quran in several places, for example, 36.40, 10.24, 31.29, 39.5. One verse of the Quran actually mentions that God shaped the Earth like an egg. It mentions the Arabic word duhya, which, uh, or dahaha, which comes from the word duhya, which means an egg. That's in Surah 79.30. There are even passages which tell us that God coils the night and day around, just like the man coils the turban around his head. Uh, do you find this, for example, mentioned in Surah 39, uh, number 5? And the word for coiling is Yukawir in Arabic, which actually uh, is related to the Arabic word Korah, which means a ball. Now, some of these things you'll have to check out on your own, and I will now mention some testimony from scholars in the field of embryology uh, to tell us that some of the most recent discoveries actually coincide with statements already made in the Quran. Dr. Keith Moore is a professor of uh, anatomy and chairman of that department at the University of Toronto in my country and uh, he tells us in his uh, article uh, which free copies of which I have available outside in his own writing to tell us what, what, about his findings. He tells us that Microscopes were not invented until the 17th century. And, for that reason, the study of the growth and development of the human embryo remained shrouded in myth and superstition. But he says, when he had a chance to read the Quran, he says, and I quote him now, I was amazed at the scientific accuracy of these statements which were made in the 7th century AD. That was too early for these statements to be accurate, and yet here they are. Now, the Quran tells us that God made us made us in the wombs of our mothers in stages one after another. That's in Surah 39 and in number 6. Now, the Moore says about this, and I quote, the realization that the embryo developed in stages in the uterus was not discussed or illustrated until the 15th century AD. That's many centuries after the Quran, regardless whichever date you use, whether you use the very uh, conservative date or a liberal or a very <coughs> ultra, ultra liberal or ultra skeptical date, you must uh, admit that this is many, many centuries after the Quran was already available. And he says further on, that the staging of human embryos was not proposed until the 1940s, and the stages used nowadays were not adopted worldwide until a few years ago. Now, Dr. Moore uh, says that the idea that development results from a genetic plan already contained in the chromosomes of the zygote 
was not discovered until the end of the 19th century, and yet he finds this knowledge already clearly implied in the Quran in Surah 80, number 18. Furthermore, the way in which two stages of growth are described in the Quran, mentioned in relationship to one, one to another, shows that there is a lag, a gap, a delay between the development from one stage to the other. And Dr. Moore says concerning this that, quote, the agreement between the lag or gap in development mentioned in the Quran and the slow rate of change during the second and third weeks is amazing. These details of human development were not described until about 40 years ago. Uh, unquote. Now, furthermore, Dr. Moore says after all of this, he says that he hopes the agreement which he has found between the Quran and science, uh, quote, may help to close the gap between science and religion which has existed for so many years. And I hope for you too, folks, that will be the case, that this will close the gap that some people may have thought exists between science and religion. And let's get in some more detail and look at some of the, the slides which I have to show you. Now, one of the stages mentioned in the Quran is described by the word alaka in Arabic. Now, this word alaka in Arabic could mean a clot of blood. That's the most common and obvious meaning to a person living in the 7th century AD, when the Quran was first available. Or it could also mean a thing that hangs. Ya'alak in Arabic means he hangs or it hangs. So the thing, the alaka is the thing that hangs. And it could also mean a leech. The name for a leech in Arabic is alaka. You know, the thing that sucks, sticks to your feet and blood sucker. Now, indeed, uh, the the human embryo at this early stage of the game looks like a blood clot because if you look at the beginning of the uh, flow of blood, initially it does look like a clot of blood according to Dr. Moore's description in his book, The Developing Human, um, the fifth edition, page number 65. The other thing you will notice is that the human embryo is hanging from the mother's placenta and uh, that gives the rise to the other meaning of the same word. You see, whoever authored the Quran used a word which would be understandable to the 7th century Arab and also would contain meanings that would unfold as the book is read over the centuries and more things are discovered. So the word is still appropriate, it is still hanging there. Let's look at the next uh, uh, diagram. Now, this is from Dr. Moore's article and as I said, some copies of this article is available outside. We do have a limited supply. But uh, you can always write to me in Toronto and we'll send you another copy. Now, Dr. Moore said, when he saw this term uh, for blood sucker in, in Arabic, alaka, and, that, and this word is used for the description of the early human embryo, he said that intrigued him. So he went over to the zoology department to get a copy of the leech, uh, a picture of the leech. So he compared the picture of the leech with the picture of the human embryo at 24 days old, and he found them to be identical in outward appearance. Let's look at the next slide. Now the next one is uh, again from Dr. Moore, and he looks at the human embryo at 28 days old. And uh, the word for that stage of the game is called in Arabic mudgha in the Quran. Uh, mudgha means a chewed lump. And Dr. Moore made a plasticine model of the human embryo and bit into it to, to leave teeth marks impressed upon it to compare what the human embryo looks like with the human, sorry, what the plasticine model looks like compared with the human embryo at 28 days old with the somites now forming looking like the teeth mark. So the human embryo at that stage of the game does look like a chewed lump. Let's look at the next slide. In the next one, I want to show um, a comparison so you can see the relative <coughs> size. Now, the actual size is up to here. Actually, if you compare that with a grain of rice, can you put a grain of rice up there so we get it? And because obviously it's blown up here, and I just wanted you to be absolutely sure. This is actually less than half of a grain of rice. This is the human embryo at 26 days old. 26 days old. That's the grain of rice there. You know, the, the, that, the human embryo at this stage is less than half the size of a grain of rice. Folks, that thing could not be studied by the naked eye. And this is what amazes a person like Dr. Moore, because he knows that to discover these things, one had to have a telescope. And the telescope was not, what am I saying telescope? Microscope. Uh, <laughs> you should correct me when I'm wrong. That's why I can't always trust the scholars. So, 
looking at, at, at this human embryo through a microscope, then you can discover that it looks like a leech. Then you can discover that it looks like a chewed lump, not before that. So how did that knowledge get into the Qur'an? You see, I'm not asking when the Qur'an first appeared. But I'm saying even if you take the, the ultra-skeptical ultra, the ultra skeptical view, you still have to admit that the book that you have in your hands and you're reading it, you have to be amazed just like these scientists are amazed. Now, it's not just Dr. Dr. Moore who is amazed about this. There are other specialists in the field as well. So just in case one man happens to be wrong, there are other supporting evidence. But it's very difficult to imagine that a man like Dr. Moore is wrong about his field uh, here. Dr. Moore is the author of the textbook on embryology, which is studied in universities throughout the Western world. Uh, and uh, he has been professor of the University of Toronto, chairman of that department, until he retired some years ago. But there are other scientists of very, very high ranking. Dr. Tivian Prasad, the professor of anatomy and head of that department at the University of Manitoba. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Joe Lee Simpson. That's J.L. Simpson, not O.J. Simpson. Uh, uh, professor and chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas. Dr. Marshall Johnson, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Anatomy and Developmental Biology. He is a Director also of the Daniel Bull Institute, Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia in the United States of America. Dr. Gerald Joe Ringer, Professor and Coordinator of the Medical Embryology Department of Cell Biology at Georgetown University, Washington, uh, United States. And Dr. Tejatet Tejatet. Jagan, you're going to have to forgive me there. Mm -hmm. Chairman of the Department of Anatomy and Faculty of Medicine at the University of Chiang Mai in Thailand. All of these are scholars of very high rank in the field of embryology, and they're discovering that what the Quran has said uh, actually is corroborated by modern science, and this is amazing. And it can only mean that this information was somehow inspired into the Prophet Muhammad of whom he peace, because it was not available on the human level. Now, I'd like to uh, look at another area of evidence. The fact that the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace is predicted in the Bible. So this will be information for those who already believe in the Bible. They might want to consider believing also in Muhammad and also accepting the Quran. So that your answer can also be both. If you're not thinking that the Bible alone, you might come to the Bible and the Quran. Now, where does the Bible speak about the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace? Several places. Among them are these. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, it is said that God promised to send a prophet like Moses from among the kinsmen of the Israelites, from among their relatives. And uh, the several descriptions are given about that prophet, how he will hear the message of God, how he will convey that. And God says, you must listen to him, otherwise I will exact that from you. Now, when we read in the New Testament, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verses 19 to 23, we see that the early Christians knew that Jesus had not fulfilled that prophecy. Although it is true that much later, Christians settled down with the understanding that Jesus did fulfill that prophecy, so they wait for no other. However, the earliest Christians knew that Jesus did not fulfill that prophecy. Read Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 23. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, we have the name of the Prophet Muhammad al be peace mentioned in addition to a description of him. So the fact that his name is mentioned there, this uh, points unmistakably to the man Muhammad al be peace. In John chapter 16 verses 7 to 15, we have a description from Jesus al be peace of the one who is going to come after him. The name Jesus mentioned there of that person, not so much a name but a title, is Paraclete or Parakletos in the Greek. Now, Jesus said that he's going to be another paraclete, which means that Jesus is one of them. I'm going and another one is coming. What is the meaning of this word paraclete? I know that many Christians, influenced by John chapter 14, verse 25, would think that paraclete means the Holy Spirit. However, many Bible commentators and many Bible notes uh, bear witness that it is difficult to see how the Holy Spirit could have fulfilled the functions which are mentioned there of the one who was going to come after Jesus. They cannot see how it might have been possible. However, when we look at the meaning of the word paraclete, you know what it means? It means one called to the side of, because it comes from the Greek word parakaleo, which means para, to the side, and you know two parallel lines, two lines that run beside each other, para. Uh, and kaleo means to call, so call the side. Now that could mean call beside a, a someone else, or it could mean also call to uh, be by someone else to speak a message. 
Now, what is the word Nabi in Hebrew? You know this word Nabi in Arabic, same word Nabi in Hebrew. What does that mean? If we look at Harper's Bible Dictionary, a copy of which I have here for anyone who would like to check that today, the word Nabi means one who calls or one who is called. That's on page 826. And what does paraclete mean according to the same dictionary? Called to the side of, on page 749. Is it getting close enough, folks? Yes, the Bible does speak about Muhammad and whom be peace. Now, as I've said, my answer to the question is that God speaks through the Bible and also through the Quran. I've shown good evidence that God speaks through the Quran. Now, it's left for me now also to show good evidence that God speaks through the Bible. But I think uh, Smith has already shown that, and I don't need to repeat that. There is indeed good supporting evidence to show that much of what is there in the Bible is actually true. And Muslims do believe that. However, we should ask another question about both books. Since we know that God speaks in those books, is it possible that man is also speaking in those books? In other words, when we look at the Quran, for example, do we find any place that there is any evidence that the human being is speaking? No. In fact, throughout the Quran, from beginning to end, God challenges you. Find an error in it. If this book had not been from God, if it had been from anyone other than God, they would have found in it much discrepancy, according to Surah 4, number 82. The Quran challenges people. If you think this came from a human being, offer one like it to show us that it can be done. And of course, it cannot be done. When we look at the Bible, what do we find? Do we find any evidence that some parts may have been written by human beings? Yes. Actually, the Bible bears evidence to that itself. The Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12 says, I am saying to you, not the Lord. So the Lord is not speaking in that verse. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 14 to 16, the writer Paul admits making a mistake. He wrote something, then he knew he made a mistake. He said, no, let me correct that. And he said, well, okay, I don't know if I'm saying the right thing still. Let me explain. You see, he says that uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that when I was in Corinth, I didn't baptize anyone except the household of Stephanus. And then he said, oh, oh yes, and I also baptized this other person. And then he says, well, if I baptized anyone else, I don't remember. <laughs> so, and mind you, I don't mention this for anyone to laugh, but uh, because we're not here for entertainment. But I, I mention this for you to think about and for you to understand what should be your answer to the question, in which book does God speak and God alone? In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, the writer Paul is extremely angry with his opponents. And he's so angry that he is out of control. So he knows it too. And he says, I I'm, I'm going to speak foolishness. And then in the, he can't get over it. In verse 17, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, you know, 17 verses later, he's still writing this. And then he says, you know, what I'm saying, I'm saying not with the Lord's authority, but as a fool. Then in verse 21 of the same chapter, he says, I'm speaking as a fool. He's reminding you, because, you see, he knows what he's saying he shouldn't be saying. But he cannot control himself as a man in deep anger. And then uh, finally, in the next chapter, in verse 11, he's still going at it. In verse 11 of the next chapter, he says, I've been a fool. You can see he's now calming down. So now, that whole chapter 11, and up to 11 verses of the next chapter, is that from God? How can you say that? You must admit that it is really from Paul. He told you himself, I'm not saying it from the Lord, I'm saying it as a fool. Now, has the Bible remained the way it was first made available when God spoke to human beings? Uh, no. And the Bible says that itself. In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8, it says, How can you say I, we are wise and we have the law of the Lord? Why? Lying pens of the scribes have falsified it. That's what the Bible itself says. So if you believe that God is speaking through the Bible, then at least you should believe this verse. If you believe the Bible to be true, then the Bible itself is admitting that parts of it cannot be true. Now, to illustrate that, I said that I, I would like to show you evidence that will help you to see these things for yourself, so that you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to believe in some scholar who said that. You don't have to look at archaeological evidence and so on. Look at whether the, you know, the Bible is telling you the truth in all cases, and you will see that uh, actually this is not so. I'll let you that. Now, just ask some questions and go to the Bible 
and see what answers you have. I have a booklet here which I authored a couple of years ago uh, entitled 101 Contradictions in the Bible. I'd like to offer a copy to Mr. Smith so that uh, you don't have to turn around and strain your neck looking at these. <laughs> we can be able to formulate a reply for me. Because I'm very interested in knowing, is there really a reply for this? Because nobody has been able to give me that reply. Who incited David to count the fighting men of Israel? According to 2 Samuel, God did. According to 1 Chronicles, Satan did. You can't have it both ways, folks. Now let's go to the next uh, contradiction number two. Is that camp, or in that camp, how many fighting men were found in Israel? According to 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 9, 800,000. According to 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 5, 1,100,000. That's a difference of 300,000 men, and you don't just round off 300,000 men. <laughs> now let's go to the next contradiction, number three. How many fighting men were found in Judah? According to one report in 2 Samuel, 500,000. According to 1 Chronicles, 470,000. Mind you, these numbers were all written out in words. It's not just that you, you, you drop the zero or something like this. But, uh, you know, the, the words were written out in full in Hebrew characters, and this is the problem you have. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Now, the Bible says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And then you must decide now, if this um, Bible is divided against itself, can we say that all of it is from God? And this is what we have to be honest with, folks. Now, uh, how many uh, years of famine was David threatened with? According to 2 Samuel 7, according to 1 Chronicles 3. I'm using things for which there's no need for any interpretation. So you can't quarrel with me over the interpretation. The numbers are there, they are clear. Now, what you should ask yourself is this. If you find a book that has this kind of things in it, would you be happy to turn that in and say, this is my book, I wrote this? Would you turn a paper to one of your professors if it has mistakes in it and you'd be proud to say, that one with the mistakes, that's mine. <laughs> See, you have to be clear and, and know what you're saying about God. Now, I'm not here to criticize the Bible. I'm not here to upset any Christian. You know, I, I agree the Bible is a very good book. And I know that many Christians are sincere, devout uh, worshippers of God and they're trying to do the right thing. And the Bible has helped them to change their lives around. They give up uh, drinking, adultery, gambling, and all kinds of things which Muslims also find to be wrong. As I've said before, God does speak through the Bible. But to what extent does He speak? And to what extent do others, apart from God, also speak? You can see, this kind of thing here is the result of other people speaking in the Bible. Now let's go to the next one. Number five. How old was Ahaziah when he began to rule over Jerusalem? Was he 22 or was he 42? Well, actually, I share this one with you. I let the cat out of the bag. He couldn't have been 42. You know why? Because if he was 42 at the time, his dad was 40 years old. So he would have been two years older than his dad. <laughs> Unless, of course, the Bible has got the dad's age wrong. That could also be possible. Let's go to the next one. Contradiction number six. How old was Jehoiakim when he became king of Jerusalem? According to one report, 18. According to another one, 8. Both are in the Bible. Which one will you believe? Let's go to number 7. How long did this lad rule over Jerusalem? According to one report, 3 months. According to another one, 3 months and 10 days. Now you might uh, excuse this one and say that perhaps he rounded it off. You know, it was 3 months and 10 days, but the other writer may have rounded it off. We don't know for sure. Uh, let's go to number 8. The chief of the mighty men of David lifted up uh, his spear and killed how many men at one time? Either 800 or 300. God is not the author of confusion, says the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Who authored these? Not God. Let's go to the next contradiction. Contradiction number nine. When did David bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem? Before defeating the Philistines or after? According to one book, before, according to another one, after, and both are in the Bible. Next contradiction. Number 10. How many pairs of clean animals did God tell Noah to take into the Ark? Either two or seven. But despite this last instruction, only two pairs actually went into the Ark when they were taken in. So does that sound confusion? Well, if it does, then know that God did not author this part in, in the Bible. Uh, now, I notice that some of you are taking hurried notes, and, and that's important that, because you need to check these out. I also have copies of this booklet available outside uh, for a small, paltry sum of one pound. Uh, so you may be able to get a copy on your way out. I don't have a copyright restriction, so you're free to copy it, circulate it, study it, and formulate a reply 
send me that. I'd really be happy to see where I'm wrong on that. Now, uh, number 11. Let's go to number 11. When David defeated the king of Zoba, how many horsemen did he capture? According to one book, 1,700. According to another book, 7,000. Can you just skip a few pages so we get a different flavor? All right, because we're dealing with a lot of numbers here and it gets boring after a while. You know, There's only so much numbers you can take. One place in the Bible it says that Solomon built a pool uh, <coughs> 10 cubits in diameter and 30 cubits in circumference. And folks, you know that's impossible because every high school math student knows that. I just asked my kids who started high school and they said, no dad, pi is 3.1416 times 10. That will give us the circumference of the pool at 31.4 cubits. Could be 30. And if you're rounding off, you might go 31.5, but you wouldn't go 30. So something is not entirely right there. You cannot find a pool that's 10, that 10 cubits in diameter and 30 cubits in circumference. Well, Smith, if you can find me one like that, I'll be ready to baptize myself. <laughs> <laughs> And if you cannot, then perhaps you should consider the Qur'an with care. Because that's what the Qur'an invites us to do. Have they not considered the Qur'an with care? If it had been from any other than God, you would have found in it much discrepancy. The kind of things which we're noticing here. So a contradiction, we're still dealing with numbers. Even if book, I've asked the gentleman to skip pages, but it, there's, there's so many numerical contradictions here. Okay, now, both Ezra and Nehemiah, they say that, you know, they had this assembly and they counted all the people, the total was 42,360. Yet, when you go to the inventory list, you see how many of this, these people and how many of the others and so on, you find that the numbers do not add up. In one book, it's 29,000. You know, it took me a long time to add these numbers, but uh, that's what it comes up to. The two do not uh, add up together. Well, you don't need to take a long time to add these numbers. I mean, there's a passage in the... <coughs> In the Bible, it says, you know, the sons of this man were six, and it gives you the list of the six names, and you see that there are only five. So you know that there's something wrong somewhere. <laughs> now, I have 101 of these to show you, but that will take too long, and, and it gets boring and uh, pointless after a while. Since I do have a little bit more time, why don't I deal with, with something which has come up recently uh, in uh, Muslim-Christian uh, dialogue? We have the fact that uh, Patricia Crone wrote uh, a few things questioning some of what Muslims had traditionally believed in. And I think we should understand uh, how to put this in some kind of perspective. You know, in every field of study, you have what is known as fringe <coughs> scholarship. You have the mainstream scholarship and you have the fringe scholarship. In medicine, for example, you may find uh, some medical expert who tells you uh, that it's, it's dangerous to go to your doctor because they do all kinds of tests on you and you know some of the things they give you that modern medicine is not good because uh, so many side effects and so on so you should stick to traditional herbal remedies and all of that now nobody would dis disagree with herbal remedies but the knock science is, uh, is really a kind of a fringe um, scholarship that will do that so you don't go by the fringe scholarship you go by the mainstream scholarship for someone to qualify as a scholar he has to get uh, approved by his peers and when one comes up with a new idea or a new thought, one has to put that in publication, have it re reviewed by his or her peers, and then um, see if, if his peers would accept that. Now, Crohn has uh, written uh, her, her book, and uh, her peers have had a chance to review that because her book, Hagarism, written by Crohn and Cook, uh, have been in uh, circulation for a while, written since 1977. And uh, let me just share with you some of what her peers have been saying about this, other scholars in the field. Cook, who co-authored the book with her, Michael Cook, and whose book I have here, Muhammad, entitled uh, Muhammad by Michael Cook. Uh, Cook actually has some very interesting things to say about that book. Did you find the reference which I asked you to find? I'm going to look at my own edition. This is a different edition. It's a different page number. Yeah, well, okay. We'll get back to it. Okay, sure. Well, I also you understand my answer to that. Mm -hmm. He's got a different edition, so it's a different page number. That's why I didn't find it on page 68. In my edition, it's page 68. I'll find it, find it uh, when we get it to have more time. I'd be very interested in that. We'll that See, I also thought that it might be a problem with the edition, because what happened was that this book actually is now reprinted as part of a four-volume work. So I had my son go to the public library in Toronto and get that four-volume work, and I was checking through it, reading back and forth, and I couldn't find the words which you quoted, Smith. <coughs> 
Yeah. So, I had this puzzle in my mind. How come you quoted something and I can't find it in that book? So I thought perhaps because the page numbers are different because of the different edition. the page number in there. Exactly. Yeah. So then uh, someone bought me this just yesterday here in, uh, in Birmingham at Waterstones. And uh, I've looked at it. I've seen something similar. I can see where you got it. But uh, obviously it's, it's not what is here. So I don't think it's a different page number. I think perhaps you made a mistake. Uh, well, it is, it is there. What yeah. we'll do is I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Yes. yes. Okay, we'll, we'll do between us. All right. Now, th this book by Michael Cook, actually, if you look at it, Michael Cook uh, makes a reference to what Patricia Crone has, has written and what he himself has co-authored with her. But he, he, he makes it a kind of tentative conclusion. He says, if those external sources are in any significant degree right, then it would follow that the tradition, that is the Muslim tradition, the hadith, are seriously misleading on important aspects of the life of Muhammad. And even the integrity of the Quran as his message is in some doubt. He doesn't say this will disprove uh, the Quran, but put some doubt in it. And then he concludes, in the view of what has been said above about the nature of the Muslim sources, such a conclusion would seem to me legitimate, but it is only fair to add that it is not usually drawn. So that conclusion to him is not usually drawn. Then he leaves that aside, and then he goes on to, to tell us more about the life of Muhammad, because that's the title of his book. And then he ignores all of those studies, because to him, these are some what he calls recondite studies, based on very obscure things. And as you listen to the discussions on that, you will find that they are very obscure. But what I would find interesting is for us to now put this in some perspective and to see where this kind of scholarship is coming from. Now, when you come to studies, you have the skeptic and you have the ultra-skeptic. Now, many skeptics have studied Islam, like uh, William Montgomery Watt and uh, Rodwell and Rodinson and so many of these uh, Orientalists. They have come to the conclusion that the Quran we have today is what was left by Uthman. Now we dispute with them and we say, well, no, not only Uthman, but way back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And they question us on that. And we can have a debate on that subject with them. However, that is what the mainstream scholarship has concluded. Crone and Cook have written the book Hagarism to try and dispute that claim and to show, no, the Quran actually came a couple of hundred years later. It was gradually evolved over time. So this is now a quarrel, not between us and them, but between the skeptic and the ultra-skeptic. Let them sort it out. For example, the book I have here by Patricia Crone, entitled Mac and Trade and the Rise of Islam. This book uh, actually is a refutation to what William Montgomery Watt and others after him have been writing about Mecca being the center of trade. So who is she refuting? Is she refuting Muslims? Well, indirectly, yes, but her quarrel is not directly with the Muslims. Her quarrel is with William Montgomery Watt and other scholars. Her quarrel is with the mainstream. You have the mainstream scholarship, she's on a fringe, and she's quarreling with the mainstream and saying, you guys got it all wrong. Now, we must wait and see if the mainstream will be convinced by her findings. If so, then we'll have a reason to sit up and take notice. But if, if Satan is divided against Satan, then Muslims would prefer to stick with listening to the words of God and to his prophet, the two of which agree with each other. Now, what is even further important to notice about this kind of scholarship is that the people who use this kind of technique, like Wansboro, William, uh, sorry, Crone, and Cook, they're approaching the documents from a secular humanist point of view, from an atheist perspective, treating them, as Smith has pointed out, as uh, documents which can be studied from uh, the point of view of archaeology, of literary criticism, and from source criticism. And when they reach their conclusions, they're reaching their conclusions not only about the Quran, they're reaching their conclusions about all religious texts. To them, God doesn't exist anyway, so there's no sense of him sending a prophet. So, a prophet cannot bring a book, because God doesn't exist. So you must treat every book like that, and this is how they regard the books. Whereas, in fact, with these very presuppositions, when they come to evaluate Christianity and Islam, they actually say some very uh, favorable things uh, concerning Islam. And I'd like to know if uh, Smith, for example, would believe in some of these things. For example, when he mentions the, um, the point of Muslim emphasis on monotheism, he says that uh, actually Muhammad and whom be peace did have a point. Because although Christians uh, profess believing in one God in three persons, 
the arithmetic is a bit elusive, and I'd like to know if you agree with uh, Cook on that. Uh, he tells us uh, furthermore that uh, in his conclusion, I'd like to find you his uh, exact words so that I don't misquote him. He says that both Judaism and Christianity are religions which appeal too easily to the emotion of self-pity. Islam, in contrast, is strikingly free of this temptation. The bleakness which we saw in its conception of the relationship between God and man is the authentic, unadulterated bleakness of the universe itself. So I'd like to know, Smith, whether you agree with Cook on these conclusions as well, and whether you agree with him that what Crone and Cook has put forward are tentative suggestions, not proven hypotheses. Now, I'd like to look at some other reviews. Peters, F. E. Peters wrote a book entitled Muhammad and the Origins of Islam. In that book he says, although it was a brave and provocative book, that is, Hagarism was, it has tempted few others to follow its suggestion. That's what F. E. Peters says on page 312. And he says furthermore on pages 116 to 117, uh, he quotes one once wrote, and he says that the limitations of this approach are underscored in one's bro in his 1978 book. So one's bro, who has been a pioneer in this field, is acknowledging that there are certain limitations which has to be borne in mind with this kind of study. Ripin, who has actually taken this kind of study in a favorable light, has the following to say. Once he has mentioned the book Hagarism in, in his footnotes, he immediately added, but compare the many adverse reviews of the work on page 139 of this book. So they all say, you know, watch out, you know, take this easy, don't go too fast with it because you cannot be sure about this sort of thing. But recently, uh, Professor Neil Robinson of Leeds University uh, authored a book entitled Discovering the Quran, published in 1996. And in that, he has a whole chapter in which he evaluates the arguments from Crone and Cook. And uh, he concludes, after much detailed analysis of their position and what the evidence on which that position is based on the conclusions that they draw, he says that their position is indefensible. He says, furthermore, Crone and Cook did not pay attention to problems of dating and interpreting the evidence from the sources and interpreting. And he said that the evidence from the sources is not clear cut. Furthermore, he says that these are too shaky a foundation on which to construct the edifice which Crone and Cook tried to build. He showed furthermore that these uh, authors rely too heavily on arguments from silence. That is the kind of argument where you say, we have no record of it, therefore it didn't exist. You know, I didn't see your car outside, therefore you're not here. That sort of thing. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting thing that happened to me. I noticed in my passport that when I came to the UK in 1996, and if my passport was stamped, it didn't say anything about my not being able to collect the gold. I didn't apply anything. Anyway. <laughs> but when I came in 1997 last year, and my passport was stamped, it says that I'm not allowed to apply for public funds. That is the first time it was stamped in my passport. Does it mean that's the first time that that law was ever in place? No, I don't think so. I think. You know, it's been in place for years now, but eventually it occurred to someone, let's put it on a stamp and put it in the passport. And that's what they did. So the first inscriptional evidence you find is not the first, um, it's not the evidence that it suddenly appeared, but a phenomenon has been in existence, but now it is finally recorded in some form. So the Cronin Cook, uh, according to Neil Robinson, do not do justice to the Quranic data. And furthermore, there are pieces of evidence which Crone and Cook uh, have not uh, dealt with. For example, just reading through some of Smith's material, I had to refer to a book uh, to which he referred to. Actually, he referred to a letter from uh, Pope Leo III, and that letter is collected in this book, edited by Newman, a Christian author and published by a Christian uh, source. And I found here in the letter that uh, in, in Omar's letter to Bishop uh, Tur Abidin, uh, he did mention... Muhammad as the prophet of God, whereas according to Cronin Cook, no such mention was made until uh, after the beginning of the 8th century. So there is lots more to be discovered and to be studied. It's a good thing that some of these authors have told us in their own words 
not to go gong ho, jump on the bandwagon of quote unquote. Their book has been written now for uh, 20 years, and uh, so far they have not been able to convince their peers that they are right. So somebody else coming in that field, dealing with other scholars in the same field, if you're not able to convince those scholars, that doesn't mean you're wrong. But why should we pay attention? You have to first produce your evidence, make it convincing to people who can evaluate that, and then speak to us. Folks, what have I shown today? I have shown that there is evidence. Is it? Thank you very much. The sisters will be praying in D117B and the brothers in D123. Um, would the facilities are available in Dawson building if you, if the son assist from UC can show that there's where to do wood and where to perform it. And uh, we'll be praying in D117. If you could, we'll have a 20 minute break for prayer, inshallah. After prayer, if you can come back and then we'll have the rest of the session. If the sisters would go first, please. At least 20 minutes for prayer, inshallah. Sisters, one, one, D117B, brothers, D123. That's to respond to Shabir's speech <coughs> and then in turn Shabir will have 15 minutes to respond to Jay's speech. After that we're going to hold a question time. Anybody that wants to ask a question please write on a piece of paper at the top the name of the person you wish to direct the question to. In that way things won't get mixed up. When you finish your question please bring it to the end of the line so that someone can walk up and down the middle of the room and it can be collected at the centre. Question time is going to take up to about 40 minutes. Okay, is this on? Great. I want to respond to about four different uh, genre or areas that uh, Shabir Ali talked about. The first one is on scientific or scientific proofs in the Quran. For those of you who want to read, I have a paper on this. It's called the Quran, uh, Internal Look at the Quran. It's on our website. You can get it as well, debate.org.uk. And I go through a lot of the scientific errors of the Quran. Now, I don't want to deal with those specifically tonight. What I want to talk about specific, more, more important is, is the area that Shabir brought up, and that is on embryology. On that website, we have a paper written that re uh, refutes or rebuts uh, a lot of the claims that Shabir Ali was, uh, was saying on embryology, written by Dr. David Pitchett, who is actually um, uh, practicing right down here in Coventry, not too far from here. And he's done a very good job. And what he has done is he's gone through and looked at all the different claims of the Quran on embryology, and he has found that basically everything that we can find in the Quran can be found in pre-Islamic literature. He found that they, they can be found in either the writings of Hippocrates, who wrote in the 5th century BC, or in the writings of uh, Aristotle, who wrote the 4th century BC, and Galen, Galen who wrote 150 AD. Everything that we see there has already been talked about. Shabir Ali said that the Quran is the first place we see these stages, and how Keith Moore was very surprised to find these four stages. It would be good if he read Galen's writing. In 150 AD, Galen speaks of the exact same four stages that we see in the Quran. Let me just show you where uh, refer to those four stages. Provided I can find it in David's paper. This is not my paper, so I'm not as familiar with it as David would be if he were here to talk about it. Uh, it talks about the stage one, the semen, the stage, the bloody vascularized fetus, the second stage. This is the features which were mapped out in, but, but unformed, the third stage, and the fourth pure stage, which were all the organs were well formed and joints were freely movable. Now, these are four stages that were quite delineated by Galen in, in, uh, in the second century. What's new about it? This was written by a man. This is not divine inspiration. This is not divine inspiration. The leech-like object that he referred to is, uh, to, uh, is referred to by Hippocrates in the, fourth, in the fifth century BC. But what is not, what Shabir did not talk about are some of the real problems with the embryological cycle that we see in the Quran. There are some real errors there when you talk about embryology. Let me just refer to three of them. Before I do that, let me talk about the alaka, because you did mention also the alaka, which is one, the, one of the stages that was referring to. If you read the Quran, you will find that there's no real, we don't really know what the alaka stage is. And if you read the different translations of the Quran, different translators name it different, uh, give it different, uh, different uh, meanings. Piktal, Maulana, Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Zafru, I don't, I forgive my pronunciation, Khan and Hamidullah, say that it was a clot. If it's a clot, 
any good embryologist know that there is no, there is no such thing as a, a clot in embryology. Uh, the others say it was a leech-like clot. That's what Yusuf Ali uses. And then some say there was a leech-suspended thing or a blood clot. Now, there's a real problem with that because we don't know of any, any clot that forms in, 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 in the embryological cycle. We do know about a suspended thing. In fact, Aristotle remarks about this. He mentions this in the 4th century BC that the embryo clings to the uterus wall much like an umbilical cord. So this is something that was well known long before the Quran was ever brought onto the sea. But let's talk about some of those errors that, that have cropped up. And let's, let's see if I can find them in his paper here. In Surah 86, Ayah 6, it says that there is a gushing, uh, that, that man is created from a gushing fluid or semen issues from between the loins and the ribs. According to Yusuf Ali's translation, he used loins and backbone. Now, those of us who know where uh, people are created know that it does not come from the loin, you know, uh, an area between the loins and the ribs. It's much, much, it's, late, it's lower down in the crotch. But where does this come from? It comes from Hippocrates' writings. Hippocrates said the very same thing. Erroneously, in the 5th century, it was copied into the Quran, erroneously, for us to see in the 20th century. Let's look at another example. In uh, Surah 23, Ayah 14, we read that Allah fashioned bones out of the Mugda, as, as you were mentioning, and covered the bones with flesh. Two different stages, the third and the fourth stage. Bones and then flesh. Any good embryologist know that there is no separate stage. The two, the two form simultaneously. They do not form bones from flesh. In fact, what we do know is that bones are not fully formed until a person is 20 years old. So how could bones have formed, formed first and the flesh <coughs> added later? A real problem there. In Surah 2, Ayah 222, it said that Allah tells women, uh, Muhammad that menstruation is an illness and men must not have sexual intercourse with their wives until they are cleansed from their periods. Menstruation is an illness. Is it an illness? But we know today that, we, that women have to have menstruation. In fact, it's just the opposite. It cleanses the body. It cleans the body at this time. What we now know is that the menstruation is not an illness. Indeed, the shedding of the endometrial, endometrial layer of the uterus helps to prevent uterine cancer. Progesterone has to be included in hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women to induce an artificial menstruation every month to prevent a buildup of uterine lining, which could become cancerous. It's just the opposite. It's not, a, it's not an illness at all. It's, it's part of the body functions that women do need so they do not have cancerous difficulties later on. Let's go on then. Uh, Shabili Ali then went and, and, and spoke about different scriptures Biblical scriptures which refer to Muhammad, prophecies of Muhammad. This is a real problem that many Muslims have. Because basically, if you're looking for the authority for Muhammad, you need to ask, well, how do we know that Muhammad's a prophet? Well, the Quran says he's a prophet. Well, how do we know the Quran is authority? Well, Muhammad says that the Quran is authority. And you can see it's, it becomes a cyclical cycle. Where do we find outside of Muhammad or outside of the Quran any, any uh, prophecy or any writings that speak of this prophet that he's yet to come? More specifically, when you look at the Quran, the Quran itself, in Surah 7, 157, says that those who follow the Apostle, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in the Torah and the Injil. So the Quran itself says that you will find Muhammad mentioned in the Torah and the Injil, in the writings of Moses and also the, the Injil. So the Quran itself says Muhammad is mentioned. So where are they in these scriptures? Surah 61, 6 says, Jesus the son of Mary said, O children of Israel, I am the Apostle of Allah, sent to you, confirming the Torah, which came before me, and giving glad tidings of an apostle to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmed. And this is why it's very quite, uh, uh, Shabir Ali, and many people, many people who have come in contact are trying to find desperately anywhere in the Bible that speaks of Muhammad. They go to Deuteronomy 18. We've got a tract on it. You can read it. It's in the back there. It's free. Read what, what we're saying about Deuteronomy 18. It's very specific who this prophet is. Deuteronomy 18 is not speaking about a man named Muhammad. It says, a prophet like unto me. And in the second part of the verse, which Muslims always refrain from quoting, says that they will come from amongst his own people, from amongst the people of, of Moses. Who were the people of Moses? You know who the people of Moses were. They were the Israelites. Who? Coming from amongst the people, from the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But read our track and find out how we explain that. Very well, uh, uh, very concise, succinct, and comprehensive. Then he goes, uh, Shabbat Ali also used the example of, I think it was Song of Solomon 516. This tract deals with that. And read it because we, we it's an important point. Because he takes the word Mahmud, the Hebrew word Mahmud, which can be translated as glorious, and assumes that this is referring to Muhammad. And it's saying, it says in Psalm, Psalms 5.16, His mouth is sweet in itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now we need to ask him some, some questions about this. 
who is this man Muhammad? Who, uh, let me just get back to this first. Who are the daughters of Jerusalem that this is referring to? Did Muhammad ever court any one of the wives of Jerusalem that this is referring to Muhammad? Which of his wives is he speaking to? Did Muhammad ever claim kingship? This is talking about a king here. Did he ever claim any of this? But if you're going to take that and use that and apply it to Muhammad, then you've got to, have to take that same word and apply it wherever that word is found in other scriptures. Because Muhammad is used 11 other times in the scriptures. Let me just give you three examples of what happens when you apply Muhammad to that word. And I don't do this as a joke, but I, would, I, I think you need to see, you'll, you'll understand why this is important. In 1 Kings 20, verse 6, it also set, mentions Muhammad. What does it say? If you apply Muhammad to refer to Muhammad, li li listen to how it sounds. Yet I will send my servants to thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thy house and the houses of thy servants. And it shall be that wherever is Muhammad in thy eyes, they shall take it in their hands and carry it away. It doesn't make sense, does it? And if you go right through the 11, and we've got them down, we've got them listed in the paper on, Mah on Muhammad, it's also on the internet. If you go right down those 11 verses, not one of them make any sense. In fact, you start realizing just how rid ridiculous an exercise this is. You cannot do that. You cannot take an adjectival phrase and make it into a noun. It is an adjectival phrase. The interesting thing is that we do have a word that could have been used instead of Mahmud called Hemda. The Hebrew word Hemda. If you want to find a noun for, for that word, then use Hemda. Hemda is a person. It's a Hebrew name of, a, of an individual. Don't use Muhammad because you can't use an you can't take a noun out of an adjectival phrase. That's the problem with the, dealing with that. Then he also mentioned the Paraclete, and we have another uh, track that you can read that goes right through this whole question. Paraclete, P-A-R-A-C-L-E-T-E. -E. Now the problem with that, and I know a lot of Muslims like to change the vowels on that, as you can do with Arabic and you can do in Hebrew. You cannot take the vowelization and put P-E-R-I-C-L-Y-T-E. -E and replace the P-A-R-A-C-L-E-T-E -E, because Greek is very specific and has the vowels already built in. You cannot do that to Hebrew. Then we've got a, a Greek New Testament right here. If you want to see what, it's, what it uses there in the New Testament, Anthony, my friend down here, has it. You can go and talk to him. John 14 and John 16. Oh, brother. John 14 and John 16 specifically say that this paraclete is who? Someone who lives in you. You do not see. Somebody who is with you forever. Do we not see Muhammad? Does he live in us? Is he with us forever? It's specifically, obviously, it's obvious if you read the context, this is not talking about Muhammad. This is talking about the Holy Spirit, which was then fulfilled in Acts 1.8. Read the tract and you'll get the background for that. Let's move on. Does, uh, let me just go too quickly to... Oh, yeah, you talk about... Um, no, let me just skip that one. Let's talk about the last area, Shabir, that you were referring to, and that is the whole problem with Orientalism. And what are we going to do with a person like Dr. Patricia Crone? One of the things we need to ask ourselves is, why is it that Dr. Patricia Crone is, act, is causing an awful lot, a lot of ruckus in the Orientalist world? The reason why is because she is saying things that are disturbing even a lot of Orientalists. You did admit that, I, and I thank you for that. Whenever somebody comes up with a new idea, especially one that is as controversial as she is coming up with, and Wandsburg is coming up with, and Hotting, and Rippin, they're all saying that much the same thing. Whenever they come up with this type of idea, it's going to send a lot of ripples. It's going to send a lot of circle, uh, ripples throughout the Orientalist community. That always happens. To name me anybody who's not come up with a new idea who has not caused a lot of controversy initially. And that's exactly what's happening in Orientalism. It's happening in, in the Orientalist schools around the world. And that's a healthy, that's a very healthy uh, aspect of what we have, what we do, what we do here in the West when we talk about research and development. We, when you do anything that's new, you're going to come up with new ideas. Now, the book, uh, Hagerism, that you referred to was written in 1977. Have you talked to Dr. Patricia Crone since she's written that book? Have you had a chance to talk to her? No, okay. Sure when they come. Okay, when uh, she's in Princeton, you might be it might be interesting to talk to her about it because she even admits today that much of what she said in, in Hagerism, she doesn't agree with today. That was, a, ex that was a, a trial, you might say. It was a testing to see what, looking at all the data there, how do you interpret it? Because the data that's coming out now is, is, is explosive. How do you interpret it? There's a number of ways you can interpret it. She, taught, she tried the Hegarian uh, motif. She does not, no, no longer agrees with the Hegarian motif. I don't think it's a, it's a plausible solution. But the data is still there, and we're still interpreting it. You ask me whether or not I can agree with their interpretation. Basically, you're saying, can I agree with what Cook and, 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 and Patricia Crone are saying? I don't at all agree with a lot of their interpretations, especially when they, when, when, when they use that same criteria against any scripture and say that this cannot be acceptable because of the fact that God does not work in time and space continuum. 
whenever they eradicate anything that has to do with miracles, I can't agree with them because their interpretation of miracles is different than my interpretation. But when they give facts, when they give figures, remember what we talked about at the very beginning, when they talk about historical facts and figures, places, and events, when they mention them and they say these do not, con these do not coincide, these uh, completely confute what we see in the traditions, then I prick up my ears. And if you read my paper, that is what I've done. I've only borrowed those ideas from Patricia Crone, those ideas from Wandsborough, which are dealing with the facts, which are dealing with the, 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 document, uh, uh, the documents, which are dealing with the inscriptions, which are dealing with the archaeological evidence that we are not pulling together together. It is that that I agree with her. Her interpretation and their interpretation, I don't necessarily agree, no. Because she is just as critical of my traditions as she is of your traditions. And I'm, I give her the room for that. That's fine. I have no problems with that. What she is saying, though, is devastating, because basically she is saying, and she's answering her critics very well, she says, How, why is it you're criticizing me for coming up with this interpretation when you yourself are dependent on traditions that are two to three hundred years older? Who is closer to the fact? Is it wrong for me to go to the seventh and eighth century and see what has been written in the seventh and eighth century? Well, you... Those of the other Orientalists are still staying in the 9th and 10th century and assuming that what happened in the 9th and 10th century, they knew what that was happening in the 7th century. What are you dependent upon? How do we know that those are correct? All we have is oral tradition based on Isnad, on these names, these, these hundreds of names that refer back on so-and-so said so-and-so, who got from so-and-so, who got from so-and-so. How do we know that any of those so-and-so said what they said? We don't know. And so she's asking a very good question. She's saying, since we don't know whether or not the traditions are correct, since we have no documentation or manuscripts to verify them, we need to go back to the 7th and 8th century. That is when I will use her. And that's when, when you as Muslims must not put your head in the sand. You've got to pay attention to those criticisms. Because it's the very same criticism we're asking of our own scriptures. You said that these men would, uh, that, that, that it would hurt our own traditions. What do you think we've been doing for 100 years? And that when, when the school in Tübingen in Germany 100 years ago started criticizing, using historical criticism against the scriptures, we didn't stay still. In fact, if you look at the names of the people who are at the head, uh, or you might say the forefront of historical criticism of the scriptures today, they are Christians. It is the Christians who are criticizing their own Bible. It's the Christians who are looking for documentary evidence. It's the Christians who are looking for manuscript evidence, and it's they who are finding the evidence. Now, the Muslims need to do the same thing. It's not good enough for you to keep on saying, I don't want to get involved. This is not our battle. It's between Orientalists. It is your battle. Okay? Thank you very much. I showed you is indisputable information. In 15 minutes, Smith could not reply to a single contradiction which I pointed out in the Bible. And we have how many of them? 101. Yes. Now, where does that leave us? That leaves us at least with this much. That since in today's meeting we have pointed out that there are 101 contradictions, we have shown examples of several of them, then at least this shows that no matter what you say about the Bible, you can show that, you know, it was right here, and it was right there, and it was right there. It mentioned a certain place, and that place existed. It mentioned a certain person's name, and that person existed. It mentioned a certain <coughs> gate, and that gate existed. It mentioned a certain wall, and that wall did fall over. But is it true in all respects? Can you trust it 100%? We have shown that you cannot trust it 100%. Yes, God does speak through the Bible, but to what extent does he speak, and how much other people have spoken? Can we believe Paul when Paul said, I'm speaking foolishness? Yes, can we put that on God? No. Should we believe the Bible when it says that the lying pens of scribes have falsified it? Yes. If you say you believe in the Bible, then believe it when it says that also. So at least on that much, we have no dispute. We've settled that already. We've shown the evidence. It has not been refuted. And that evidence is very good and solid. I'd like you to do some more study on that. Now let's uh, look at some other points. Smith wonders if um, Dr. Moore has read Galen. If Dr. Moore had not read Galen, he would not qualify as a gynecologist. They have to go through that study, and in his own paper, he does make reference to Galen and what Galen had said, but in spite of that, Dr. Moore is amazed at the scientific accuracy of the Quran and the fact that the Quran should have said such things back in the seventh century, a thousand years before the microscope, and I got it right now, the microscope 
had been invented. How did Muhammad and whom he peace discover such things? Surah 86, verse number 6, mentioning between the lines and the ribs. This has already been explained, satisfactorily given the scientific evidence to show that this is true. And it does actually happen that way in the book by Dr. Maurice Bouquet. I have it on the table here, the Bible, the Quran, and science. Dr. Jamal Dabi has also explained this on open air television. And I have a copy of the audio cassette of that which I've been listening to. And there's a good solid explanation to show that this too is a very accurate scientific expression. Now, Smith wonders, how could the bones be then made into flesh? He seems to think, you know, it shouldn't happen that way. And uh, he says, any good embryologist would know that that's wrong. Well, I think if Dr. Moore was not a good embryologist, he wouldn't have made it to the, be chairman of the Department of Anatomy at one of the most prestigious universities in the world, University of Toronto. I say that not only because it's in my city, uh, but uh, because, in fact, it is one of the prestigious universities. And if he was wrong on that, how come so many of his compatriots from many different parts of the world that I've mentioned already, other renowned gynecologists, uh, can verify his findings and say, yes, Dr. Moore is right about that. We know this field, and this man is telling the, the truth here. Now, Dr. Moore explaining the, the various stages in which the, the baby is formed does actually say, after the chewed-like appearance, bones develop which are soon clothed with muscles. And he's shown that in figure 18. The bones begin to form in the sixth week and muscles attach to them shortly after this. By the beginning of the seventh week, the bones give a human shape to the embryo's body and it's illustrated that in figure seven. Yeah, a copy of this paper is available. We do have a short supply. Hurry to get one after the day. So uh, this man knows what he's talking about. All right. So if you want to satisfy the ultra skeptic who doesn't want to believe anything, he will say, no, I don't want to listen to that scholar. But he's telling us he doesn't want to listen to you know, Dr. Moore, who is, has been chairman of a department in one of the most prestigious universities, whose findings have been corroborated by his peers, but you expect us to believe Patricia Crook, or Patricia Crook. <laughs> <laughs> you made the same mistake last time. Uh, Patricia Crone and Michael Cook, well, I don't know if it's a mistake. Uh, <laughs> are they chosen? <laughs> so, if her peers are not willing, are not willing to acknowledge her work, no, I did not say that her work has created a ripple. Somehow you didn't hear me right. And, and I think uh, perhaps you have to review that uh, book again by Michael Cook, in which you made the quotation, because that quotation wasn't right either. No, I didn't say that uh, Patricia Crone's book created a ripple. I said that her book has been available for 20 years. It's subject to review by her peers. And her peers have not found it favorable. It has had many adverse reviews. This is what I said. And those were not my own words. They were Rippin's words. Maybe I said Rippin and you thought Ripple. Rippin said, Andrew Rippin said, that her work has had many adverse reviews. No, what she has created among the scholars are laughs. And in fact, uh, uh, Abdurrahim Green in his uh, write-up on this has quoted many scholars who have reviewed the book and they find it to be uh, a good belly full. Uh, now, the Quran says about menstruation, yes, alunaka anil mahid, kul hiya azan. Say, they ask you about menstruation, say, it is an azan, a hurt. Some people may have translated that illness, but that's not a correct translation. And you're right, menstruation is not, uh, strictly speaking, an illness, but it is a hurt for the woman, and that's what the Quran says. So as a result of that, what must you do? If the Quran was copying from the Bible, you know what the Quran would say? The Quran would say that when a woman has her menstrual period, anything she sits on becomes unclean. And if you sit on that thing, you also become unclean till evening. And then you must bathe, and then you can become clean at evening time. So anything she sits on, you cannot eat with her or anything like that. That's what the Bible says. But the Quran says, as a result of this, you must just not have intercourse with the woman during the menstrual period. And that is something also that the Bible does agree with. But the Quran does not go to that extreme. The Prophet Muhammad and Humbi peace said you continue having a normal relationship with your wife, everything except sexual intercourse. Now the prophecies about the Prophet Muhammad and Humbi peace in the Bible. I'm surprised that uh, Smith would say this is a kind of a circular reasoning that says, you know, that Muhammad is, uh, you know, prophesied in the Bible. The Bible prophesies Muhammad, and then Muhammad said that the Bible is right. So this is a kind of circular reasoning. Quran. I should say Bible. Yeah. Well, I did hear Bible, and I wrote it down as soon as you said it. But you know, we can always review the. I wouldn't say Bible. Uh, in any case, 
If we move on, then since that's not a point anymore, and he didn't say that, and I don't need to reply to it. Uh, now, does the Bible actually refer to the Prophet Muhammad of whom we teach in Deuteronomy 18? Did we misquote Deuteronomy 18, 18? No, because if you look, I have the Bible here, New American Bible, it's got a cross and it's an authentic Christian publication. It has, says that the man is going to come from among the kinsmen, from among the kinsmen of the Israelites. So you know who that is. It could be the Israelites themselves, one of their close relatives. It could also be from the Ishmaelites because they are kinsmen of the Israelites. <coughs> Not necessarily from their own people, from their kinsmen according to that Bible. Now the name Muhammad in Song of Solomon chapter 5 verse 16. Is it right to say, well, wherever the name occurs, you go and you translate that, you make it Muhammad wherever that name occurs? No. In, in the Hebrew language, as with most languages, names mean something. But when they refer to a person, you keep the name. When they refer to something being done, you translate it. For example, the word Ishmael in, uh, in Hebrew means God hears. So if you found in the Bible, God hears our prayers, what do you put? The man's name? No, you don't go, Ishmael, my prayers. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. So, <laughs> so what you do is you don't put Ishmael in that place. All right. So, uh, Smith, you see the kind of glass that you create here. You, you, in all the eleven places where the name Muhammad occurs, you translate it according to the context. You give a meaning that fits the context. In this one particular place, you keep the name Muhammad because the name fits. You have a description of a man. It's telling you what, it lo what he looks like. He's shaped like this. His stalks are like this. Uh, his mouth is sweet. And all of that. And it's telling the daughters of Jerusalem that they must recognize this man. And then it says, he is Muhammad. And you want to translate that he is altogether lovely? Just because you don't want people to know it's Muhammad's name mentioned there? No. Where the name Ishmael fits, you keep it. If Abraham said something to his son Ishmael, you keep the name Ishmael. If Abraham says, God hear my prayers, you make it God hear my prayers. You don't say Ishmael my prayers. All right. So where the name Muhammad fits, as in this context, you keep it there. And that's what it is. It's a description of the Prophet Muhammad to come. Paraclete. I never use the argument today that paraclete equals periclutus. So Smith doesn't have to answer that. Now I could make that point, but I didn't make it. And I won't make it now. The point I have made is not addressed. I've quoted from the Bible translation, from the Bible dictionary, to show that the word paraclete, the very one which you do have in your Greek Bible, does actually mean something very close to what Nabi means in Hebrew and what it means in Arabic. So, Jesus, in whom this peace, was speaking about another Nabi, another prophet to come after him, that was Muhammad. How could he be in you? Well, that's for the readers of the Bible to figure out. Because if you say it means the Holy Spirit who is going to come after, well then the Holy Spirit, if he's going to come after, he's not in them yet. And this is why the writers of the Bible, if you check the various manuscripts, you see them muddled with this to try to change that because they couldn't understand what this means and they tried to change it back and forth. Now we've seen already that the Bible is not 100% Sahih. We've seen that things get changed here and there, that's why you have mistakes. So if we find a reference to the Prophet Muhammad of be peace, and it fits him 80%, and you can show, argue with me on the other 20%, well, you still don't have a good point. Because if you try to say this fits the Holy Spirit, I'll argue with you 90%. And this is what the Bible commentaries have been saying. The prophecies do not fit the Holy Spirit. We can't see how this could be done. But we can show you that it fits the Prophet Muhammad of be peace very close. There are points in which we can argue, but... The basic thrust is there. If it doesn't fit Muhammad, then not the Holy Spirit, then who? Then you have another failed prophecy in the Bible. But that's not my problem, folks. If we want to be honest, we have to now deal with the matter sincerely. Look at the Bible and see what it fits. Now, the difficulty I've had in Muslim Christian debates is this. I have found that the people who come out strongly to oppose Islam are not coming from a Christian point of view. They're coming from a secular, humanist point of view. And this is the problem we have. If you come from a Christian point of view and try to evaluate the Quran based on what you already accept as a Christian, you would find yourself hard-pressed. You have to accept Islam because the evidence is clearly ahead of you. But what Christian 
missionaries do is they step outside of their Christianity for a moment and they say, let me pretend I'm a secular humanist for the moment. And I want to examine the Quran based on archaeology, based on source criticism, uh, based on textual criticism. I haven't heard today that Mr. Smith evaluated the Bible based on source criticism. Otherwise, if you like, I can help you with that. Uh, well, to cut, to cut a long story short, instead of showing you the film, just to save time, if you go with source criticism, according to the findings of source criticism, you cannot believe much of what the Gospels say that Jesus said. You know, there's a bunch of folks in the United States of America, the Jesus Seminar scholars. They are scholars of very high rank, but they're secular humanist scholars. Did I quote them and say, hey guys, you've got to believe these Jesus Seminar people? No. I wouldn't do that, because I don't believe half of what they say either. So I can't step outside of Islam for a moment and say, let me pretend I'm one of these Jesus Seminar guys and let me just mess up the Christians. Then I can tell them, well, you know, according to what these scholars have found, only 18% of what the Gospels say Jesus said, he actually said. The rest are all forgery. So if you go through your Bible, you have a red letter edition saying everything Jesus said is painted red. You need to color 82% of those black, and that's only in the Gospel of Mark. When you go to the Gospel of John, you're in deeper trouble still. So now, I won't quote those guys because I don't share their presuppositions. Now, I know what they've said, I know why they've said it, I'm studying their works, I'm learning some things from them, and I can present what is beneficial, but I cannot share all their presuppositions, and I do not make the mistake of quoting them as authorities, because you don't believe in them, I don't believe in them, why quote them as authorities and say, hey, you've got to believe these people? No, let us present the evidence, see what it is, and let us evaluate it. So if you stand from a Christian point of view, knowing that you believe in God, you believe that God sends revelations to his prophets, he's done it before many times, you believe in the Bible, and the Bible speaks about someone to come, you will see that that someone is actually the Prophet Muhammad of whom be peace. Of course, Patricia Crone revises her ideas. She no longer subscribes to much of what is there in her Hagarism. Smith does not subscribe to much of what is there in Hagarism either. Neither do you. And Patricia Cohn is constantly revising her ideas and she will have to do more. I have her, one of her recent books here, Mac and Trade and the Rise of Islam. And reading this, no, I haven't spoken to Patricia Cohn, but I am hearing a lot of what she's saying in this book. And much of it, folks, is just plain silly. Brahman found a papyrus fragment from Palestine. That papyrus fragment, from the little bit it seems to say, seems to imply that the Battle of Badr must have taken place not in Ramadan, but in one of the earlier months in Ramadan. So now, she acknowledges that Brahman may not have read this correctly, because Brahman made a big boo-boo before. Once he found a fragment, time is out warning, I've got to go folks. <laughs> Okay, um, we're going to take a couple of minutes to let both the speakers sort through their questions. What will happen is, they both sort through their questions, and each, both each will have five minutes in order to ask the question. Jay shall go first, and then she'll be her second, and then both will have five minutes, then we'll be back to Jay and she'll be her again. This will go on for 40 minutes, and then we close the debate. Um, this is just a clarification question, sounds like. What is the significance of the fact that no mosques face the Mecca that were built before late 7th century? Why is this significant? Um, I, thought I, I, th I thought I said it pretty clearly. The reason why this is significant is, according to the, to the Quran, Surah 2, 145 to 150, the, 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 the change of the Qibla from Jerusalem down to Mecca was basically about two years after the, they had moved to Medina, two years after the Hijrah. So therefore, any mosque that we are able to uncover, any mosque that we are able to look at, should be facing Mecca post to uh, 624. Basically what we're saying, any, all the mosques. Because 
Islam or the Arabs did not control any of the of the world outside of the Hijaz, the central part of Arabia, until 635, 638, and 640, and 641. That's when they took over what we know as the Sassanid area, and then of course Byzantine area later on after that. So if we find mosques that were built in the late seventh century, at this time, all of the the, the the Quran supposedly had already been compiled. They had all the injunction. They could read Surah two. All the all the Muslims, any Muslim, should have been facing towards Mecca at that time. Any mosque, therefore, that we find in these parts of the world. And I was referring to Wasit, Kufa on this side, and Kustar over here. These are the oldest mosques we can come across. They were in the diaspora, or the areas that had been conquered in 630s and 640s. Um, now, there are quite a few questions here, There's a number of them on contradictions. And people are asking me, are there not, con are there not contradictions also in the Qur'an? And I, I meant, Shabir, I was going to deal with the questions on, on contradictions, but we just didn't have time. Let me just refer to that. In the same paper on the Qur'an that you can get on, uh, on the website, there are, I've got 38 contradictions which we find in the Qur'an itself. Shabir says that uh, if it is the word of God, there should not be any contradictions. The problem is that there's lots of contradictions. In fact, there's a law of, of abrogation or contradiction is taught in the Quran in Surah 2, 106 to 108, which states, we substitute one revelation for another. This is echoed in Surah 1786, which it reads, if it were our will, we, would, we could take away that which we have set thee by inspiration. In Surah 16, 101, we read, none of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar, knowest thou not that Allah hath power over all things. These are uh, taken from Yusuf Ali's translation. So there isn't, there's a, 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 a law of contradiction built into the Quran. Why is he making, why does he have a problem with these contradictions in the Bible? It's interesting, and you, you probably all noticed that almost all the contradictions were numerical contradictions. Did you, not, did you not notice that? We're well aware of this. What is going on here? What is happening? When you look, and if you, if you have found anybody that has studied manuscript evidence, anybody that's gone back to ancient manuscripts, one of, the, one of the things that you will find, rule of thumb, that anybody that's studied ancient manuscripts, is that numbers are always copied uh, wrong when, when copies are made of copies of copies of copies. We don't have the originals of these manuscripts, we know that. When copies are made, what happens? In the earliest days, they, had, they were written on scrolls. They were not written in books as we have today. Books were not really brought, brought into existence until the 4th century. When you have scrolls, they wear out. Now, if you look at the Hebrew, Shabir Ali says that these were written out in words. They were actually written out in numbers, numerical run numbers. You had the radical numbers at the top, and you had the uncial numbers at the bottom. Whenever you have the radical numbers at the top, that means on the side of the scrolls, if there's going to be any wearing out, it'd be those radical numbers that are worn out. Note and look through Shabir Ali's book. I challenge you to do so. And look at the numbers that are rubbed out. It's almost always the decadal numbers that are rubbed out. Now, if there is a scribe that's going to then copy that over, that would be the number that he would not copy over. So what do we have here? Basically, these are copyist errors. Now, it's interesting that if you look at, if you do a comparison between the, the Masoretic text, which is the text, one minute, thanks, the text which was, uh, that we use today from the, that was compiled by the Masoretes in 918, compare it with the, uh, the uh, Septuagint that was compiled in 125 BC, you will find that many of these problems do not exist, exist in the Septuagint. Then many of these numbers are, are, are quite, are, 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 are adequate, I'm sorry, that's not the right word. Are quite are, are, are plausible. In fact, make a lot of sense. So you can see that if between 125 AD BC and 918 AD, there has been copyist errors. We are we're aware of that. We're quite aware of that. That's not a problem. We would expect that. You would not expect that in a, in a revelation that came within a 23-year period, though. Why is it only? And I've got 38. They're listed here. You, we have another paper that's on the uh, that Johann Katz's site that has many more contradictions. Radical contradictions, numerical contradictions, contradictions with the complete theologies there. Read our papers, and I can just name some off. Maybe when we have more time, I'll go through some of these contradictions that we find in the Quran. That's a real problem. Okay? Or do I have more time? Time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in my five minutes, I'm told that I, I can answer some questions, and I can also respond to some of the things that Joseph Smith said. And when he comes back, he can respond to me as well. Why are the mosques facing in several different directions? Well, actually, that's the, the real question, because they're not all pointing in the same direction. The mosques are facing in different directions. The two earliest mosques, which are quoted as, as proof that they're not facing towards Mecca, actually do not face both to the same direction. And this was pointed out by Neil Robinson, uh, I would like to hear it also from Smith. You see, that these people are trying to give us the impression that all of the mosques are pointing somewhere else, not Mecca. But they don't tell us that they're fighting in several different places, which means that the Muslims just simply got it wrong when they were building their mosques. 
And it's happening even today. Neil Robinson has pointed out that even in Switzerland today, they've constructed a mosque and then realized it's pointing in the wrong direction. Then they built a se separate, a second prayer niche to face the right direction. It's not only happening in Switzerland. I have examples of this right in my own hometown. So <laughs> this is happening everywhere. So if Muslims make mistakes, it doesn't mean that Mecca didn't exist. This is an, an argument from silence. You know, we didn't find the Muslims were praying towards Mecca, so Mecca didn't exist. No. Jacob of Edessa said when, I, when he was studying in Alexandria as, as a youth, he saw that the Muslims were facing, you know, towards Jerusalem. When Neil Robinson said it's easy to explain this, perhaps Jacob of Edessa had a lapse in memory. He thought that that's how he remembered it. But uh, what other evidence do you have apart from these two mosques which are facing in two different directions? Then if you take Jacob of Edessa's statement, then that's the third direction yet from where the two other mosques are pointing. So now, so the Muslims were facing every which way? No, in fact, Mecca was mentioned by Ptolemy, and uh, Neil Robinson has shown evidence that Mecca was mentioned as Makoraba. Yathrib was mentioned as Yathribah. Neil Robinson admits that uh, Mecca was a little bit off according to where Ptolemy has placed it, not in exactly the right place, too far is to be Mecca, but if that's what Ptolemy intended, and if he had other mistakes which he had, then it's quite understandable why his Mecca is off, because his map is generally off. So uh, this kind of thing, you know, trying to build evidence from silence doesn't work. That's to say, we have no evidence that the Muslims were facing Mecca, therefore they were not facing Mecca. No, having the evidence for a thing and the reality of the thing are two different things. I don't know, therefore it is not so. That's a foolish argument, an argument from silence. You can sometimes make a little bit out of it, but don't try to build too much out of an argument from silence. And this is what Neil Robinson said is the problem with Patricia Crone's work. So much of that will have to be reviewed. Now, contradictions in the Quran. You know, something missed me. It must be that I'm very daft, but I heard Mr. Smith read out four passages from the Quran or mention four passages and what they say, but I couldn't for the life of me sense what is the contradiction there. Perhaps he can tell us again, and then I will reply to them. So if this is what amazes me. The best people can come up with as contradictions are just little quibbles <laughs> over words here and, and meanings here. But we're showing actual proof, and that brings me to the third point. Now, Smith admits that there are numerical errors in the Bible. Well, great. And this is what we've been saying. And remind, remember what I said before. The people who come to argue with us are not believers in the Bible. They know that the Bible has errors. So they're not so interested in defending that. They're interested in attacking something else. They're interested in causing doubt so that, you know, they have lost faith and they're interested in causing doubt in other people too so that they should also lose faith. Lose faith. Somehow it is like this. I mean, if you admit you have a book and it makes mathematical errors, it tells you there are six people and you can count them, there are only five. It tells you 15 cities and you can count them, there are 16. Matthew tells you there are 13 generations from the Babylonian exile to Jesus. You can count them. He tells you there are 14, there are only 13. So if you say a name has dropped out there, a zero has fallen out there, what are you saying? You're saying your book is full of holes. Do I have one minute more? So if that is what it is, then please admit that and let's go forward. We discuss more from there. We recognize who we're dealing with. If you're, you're dealing as a believer or half a believer, we have to know that. But folks, it's not just numerical contradictions. I know that the numbers were not written as numbers, they were spelled out as words. And we don't just lose a zero. I mean, how do you go from 800 to 1100, round off 300 men? How do you go from that? You don't just lose a zero, and eight has to be changed to an 11. All right? Now, but there are others. When you come to the life of Jesus, where he was at a particular time, which day he was, which place, all of that is very contradictory. What he said on a certain occasion has been changed by certain gospel writers to give a new impression of what Jesus should mean for us. It's not just contradiction in numbers. I've given you those so we don't argue over interpretation. So I've given you clear contradictions, and there are many more as well. Thank you very much. All right, let's, let's do, since we're talking about contradictions, let's stick with contradictions. Uh, I think you misunderstood what I was saying, Shabir. I wouldn't say that those were contradictions. That's the law of contradiction, that, of, of abrogation that is, in, that is in the Quran. Let me give you some contradictions now since you've asked for them. Let's go through some of the contradictions. You talk about numerical contradictions. What are you going to do with the um, Surah 7, 54, Surah 25, 59, which speaks that there are six days in creation? Then Surah 41, Ayah 9 through 12, talks that there are eight days in creation. Numerical errors, two different numbers for the same uh, amount of the same creation. 
There's a numerical error. Now, we, you cannot blame this on copyist error. You cannot blame this on scribal error, because this is we're talking about only 1,200 years ago, not uh, 23, not uh, 1,400 years ago. What about the plagues? Let me give you these contradictions. Uh, numerical errors again. In Surah 17, Ayah 101, we have nine plagues listed, or signs, whereas in Surah 7, 133, only five were listed. Again, a contradiction in numbers. And I could go, I could go on. There are others. Let me just give you some others as examples, just so you know what I'm talking about. In Surah 3, Ayah 84, also Surah 2, Ayah 285, Surah 2, Ayah 136, it talks that there is no, that there is, that all prophets are initially equal, that they are equal in status. Then in Surah 2, 253, suddenly it says that some are elevated above others. Let's continue on down. Let's go through some. I've got, I'm going flipping through because there's a whole pile here I could go. I don't want to waste too much time. In Sur, careful. In Surah 17, 103, we are told that Pharaoh was drowned with his army. Yet in Surah 10, 90 to 92, we are, upon admitting of the power of God, he is re 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 rescued as a sign to others. Angels are, are commanded to uh, bow down to Allah. I'm sorry, bow down to Adam in Surah 15, Ayah 29 to 30. And also in Surah 20, 116, which they do. Yet Allah prohibits anyone worshipping anyone but Him in Surah 4, 116. And also Surah 18, 110. In Surah 4, 157, we read that Jesus did not die. Yet in Surah, 30, Surah 19, 33, we read that not only did He die, but He rose again. And this, the, here, there you get. You, go, you, you have a problem with abrogation. The words of the Lord are perfect and true in justice. There's none who can change his word. It says in Surah 6, 115. Now talk about abrogation. What does it say here? Nobody can change the word of Allah. Also, as you see this in 634 and also 1065. But then Allah sees the need to change some of them for better ones. Surah 2, 106, 161. The whole law of abrogation goes against what he just said earlier. There's an abrogation right there. Now what are you going to do with that? Guide you to the truth. Let me just well let me let me just continue on with this. Guide you to the truth, say God. He guides the truth and which is worthier to be followed in Surah 1035. But how much is left over from this worthiness when we also read, Allah leads astray whom He pleases, and He guides whom He pleases, Surah 14.4. And how do we know in which of Allah's categories of pleasure, of pleasures we fall? What about the punishment of adultery? Flogging with a hundred stripes, according to for men and women, uh, in Surah 24, Ayah 2. Confine them to houses until death do they claim them. Lifelong house rest for the women in Ayah uh, Surah 14, 4, 15. Seems to abrogate exactly what we see about the flogging. What are you going to do with that? So you do see that there's a lot of problems with, with contradictions. Now, I've heard Muslims who have tried to answer this say, well, this has to do with progressive revelation. That things change in Muhammad's life. So therefore, it followed his life, his life issue. Now, we have the same, uh, uh, we have the same categories with, uh, with, with Christendom. And we talk about this in theology, that there's a progressive revelation. Progressive revelation makes sense when you're dealing with different cultures, when you're dealing with different eras, when you're dealing with different people. What God said to Abraham, what God said to Moses back in 1400 B.C. and 2300 and, and 1900 B.C. would not apply to people that come a, a, a hundred to a thousand to two thousand years later. So therefore there would be a need for a, a different revelation. Just as cultures change, so does the, 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 the revelation that changes for them. I find this with my own sons. I have laws and regulations for my younger son, which I don't have for my older son as he grows up. Then more is expected of them. But we would not expect this in a time period of just 23 years, and this is what we find in the Quran. Why are these abrogations there? Some people have counted 222 abrogations or contradictions in the Quran. Why are they there? It does not make sense. Now let's go on to another area. I don't know if we, can we get onto this, or how are we doing on it? 45 seconds. The Gospel of Barnabas. Um, <laughs> What are we going to do with the Gospel of Barnabas, somebody asks? Is it not also a, a book that we should adhere to because it talks and it speaks, about, uh, uh, it speaks about Muhammad? The Gospel of Barnabas, I think you just need to read. Anybody who has a copy, read and look at it. You will find that in, there's an awful lot in the Gospel of Barnabas that also contradicts the Quran. All right. What we do find, if you look at the Gospel of Barnabas, you can find that whoever wrote the Gospel of Barnabas did never lived in Palestine. It talks, what does it say? It says that Capernaum is up in the mountains. It says that Galilee is down on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, sea of, uh, uh, sea of Galilee. Sea of Nazareth is on the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is up in the mountains. Obviously, anybody who's been to Canaan okay, will know that that's completely impossible. Hi. All right. <coughs> I'd love to be quick so that I can get on with some of your questions, too, to be fair to you. But very quickly, contradiction. Does the Quran contradict itself saying six days and eight days? No, because the verse which is commonly quoted to say that means eight days doesn't mean that. Does the Quran say God created the heavens and the earth in eight days? No. 
It says that God created the earth in two days. They measured out the sustenance in four days. So you make that six. God also says that he turned to the heavens when it was smoke and called it and the earth flowered in two days. So you see God created the heavens and the earth in the same first two days. But it just so happens the way it's mentioned in the Quran, two days for the earth, four days for the sustenance making six. And when God mentions again that he created the heavens and the earth in two days, they're adding it up to make it eight. But how can you add what you've already counted? You counted the first two days, then you counted four more, now you're mentioning the first two days again, and you're counting that to make it eight? You know, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So that's not a contradiction. And that shows us, it shows us that, you know, the people who have wasted their lives to find contradictions in the Quran, this is the kind of nonsense that they come up with. Number two. He said, you know, this surah mentions nine plagues, that surah mentions five plagues. Did any surah of the Quran say, you know, the maximum number God mentioned is five? Because if it did, then the next one that says nine would contradict. But if one surah says, these are the things which God did to, to Pharaoh, and list them one, two, three, four, five. Another surah says, you know, these are what God did to Pharaoh, list them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They're not contradictory. It's just that one has given you more details which are not found in the other one. That's not a contradiction. It's a contradiction if one says no more than five and the other one says nine. Then you know you didn't make a contradiction. That's the kind of thing that I've been pointing out in the Bible. Give me something similar in the Quran. If you cannot, then at least accept tonight, look, the Quran has a better claim to be the Word of God than the Bible does. Third contradiction. In one surah it says all prophets are equal. In another surah it says that some prophets are elevated above others. Well, that's not a contradiction. Because the, the place where it says, you know, we believe in all of the prophets. We do not differentiate between any of them. That says that we as believers will not say we accept one prophet and reject the other. Because as prophets of God, they're all on an equal plane. But... Among prophets, there are some who God preferred above others. There are many stones in the world, but some are precious stones. They're still called stones, but they're all stones. Some are better stones than others. So they're all prophets. We don't reject one and accept another one, but some of these prophets God has preferred above others. Just like you wear certain stones on your finger, but not some others. Now, the Pharaoh was drowned according to the Quran. Does that contradict with the Quran which says that God rescued him? No, because if you quote the verse, you know, if you go rapid fire, you know, Surah this, I number that, Surah 3, I number that, Surah, then we don't know what you're saying. But if you stop and you quote the verses and show why it is contradictory, you see it is not. The verse which says that God saved him says, Today we save you in your body that you may be a sign for those who will come later. Pharaoh was drowned, the Quran was right. And Pharaoh's body was saved. The Quran was right. And the Quran was right long before this information could be discovered. Hundreds of years later on, in 1898, the body of the Pharaoh was discovered. Yes, God had saved that body as a sign for people who would come later. The Quran mentioned something about the Pharaoh which could not have been known to the Prophet Muhammad and whom he is, that his body was saved. The Bible does not give that impression. It just gives you the impression that Pharaoh was drowned. He was left there to perish in the ocean. Whereas, in fact, his body was saved, the Quran didn't contradict itself, but gave us information for which we can respect it. Angels bow down to Adam. Does the Quran say that the angels worship Adam? No. So if you find another verse which says, worship only God, that doesn't contradict. In ancient times, people used to bow down to their kings. We find that in the story of Yusuf, that people were bowing down to their kings. It was acceptable, but in the Sharia of Muhammad, God abrogated that law. Is there anything wrong with abrogation? No, Christians accept abrogation. Mr. Smith himself said he accepts abrogation. He said it shouldn't be in 23 years. Well, if you have a growing community, just like you have your growing kids, what you say to your 23-year-old is not the same thing that you say to your 3-year-old. And you can't even speak to your 15-year-old. <laughs> Did the Quran say that Jesus died and rose again? No. The Quran said that God lifted him up and they killed him, not, not crucified him. So God raised him, but not after death. The Quran doesn't contradict itself. I seem to go back and forth on contradictions here. Let's go. Let's try some other some other questions that people have asked. I think that we need to try to respond to some of the audience. Can you?
Can you explain the events of the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD? This comes up quite often at that speaker's corner, and uh, we do have a tract that is written on it. If you want to read it, it's back in the back. Please feel free to get it on the Council of Nicaea. There have been mis many misconceptions about the Council of Nicaea, whether or not it was here the Bible was put together. What is, very, what is well known, and what we do know quite, quite adequately, is that certainly the 27 books of the New Testament were well known, were well uh, amongst the, uh, the, 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 the early church, the early church fathers quote from them extensively. What happened at the Council of Nicaea? Basically what happened at the Council of Nicaea was a canon was finally imposed on it. What does that mean? You only need a canon because there's somebody else who's come up who's put a counter canon. There's a man named Marcion who earlier than that decided to create his own canon. He did not like certain books of the Bible, so he created and had a following of people that created their own canon, rejecting some books and adding others. It was because of that that the Council of Nicaea decided to then put a stamp of approval from the authority of the church with these are the 27 canonical books. That's all that's going on there. They were not chosen at that time. They had all, always had been chosen. Nobody ever had a need. There was never a need to put together a canon before that time. The same thing at, at Council of uh, Jamnia in AD AD. Why is it that they waited so late to have a Council of Jamnia in AD AD to put, to put together the, uh, the canon of the Old Testament when they've been, those books have been around for hundreds of years? The reason why is because the Jews were now uh, being dispersed, and they realized that they need to put down, they need to, uh, you might say, authority, give authority to these specific books, so that the Jews, when they took these, uh, the Torah and the other uh, books of the prophets into them, into exile, they would know which were the authoritative books, okay? That is why you have such a late, uh, 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 a late edition. That does not mean that the Bible was created at that time, a misnomer that many Muslims need to be corrected on. Um, okay. A question has come up again, uh, uh, and uh, two questions have come up again about this comforter. And, I, and I, Shelby Dadi also mentioned, so let me just get, uh, uh, make that. In fact, let me also talk about Deuteronomy 18, since you brought that up as well, Shelby Dadi. You said that it doesn't matter whether or not this is a, this is a, a, a prophet like Moses, and then continuing on for somebody from within a prophet like you, uh, Moses, that this could be somebody within their own kin, that Ishmael would qualify as that. I think what you need to do is you need to take uh, you need to take that scripture and you need to put it into perspective of what was God's perspective. And, and, and whenever you look at script, scripture, we need to look at it from God's perspective. I know that a lot of Muslims like to look at the Bible from man's perspective. They try to delineate, try to try to uh, uh, tr uh, uh, interpret the scripture from that that, uh, that 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 way of looking at it. But it's it, in this context, you need to see who was it and what was the mission of Moses versus what was the mission of Jesus Christ. Obviously, this is referring to a person who had the same mission that Moses had. What did Moses do? He came to save his people. What did Jesus come? He came to save the world. There's, it's the mission that God looks at is the reason why he, the, the, this prophecy is referring to not Muhammad, but to Jesus Christ. Now, that's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's solidified much clearly in the book of John. John 1. Uh, verse 45 says, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, referring back to Deuteronomy 18. John 5, 46. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, Jesus, for he wrote about me. Moses wrote about me. Where did he write about him? Deuteronomy 18, 18. John 6, 14. Surely this Jesus is the prophet who is to come un into the world. And then Acts 3, 24, very specific. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. What's that referring to? Deuteronomy 18. So the answer is right there in, in, in the New Testament. None of us have that problem, certainly, uh, when we read. You need to look at the Gospel in, in, in context. Uh, what about the Comforter? If you read, if you just open your Bible and read the verses that go on down, and let me do that right now, because I think what we need to do is just uh, solidify this and make this, if I can find it. I can't find it. <laughs> Does anybody have a, let me just look at the Bible here. Open up to John 14. John 14 is very specific who this comfort is. And if you want any question, go to Acts 1.8. Shabir Ali says that this is referring to a prophet that is yet to come. It's not referring to a prophet at all. It's not even referring to a person. It, it's, that's very evident as soon as you read John 16. But it's, it is finally answered in Acts 1.8. And what is Acts 1.8? That's like 1 and 1, 4 and 5. Acts 1, 4 and 5 are very specific. It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you had heard me speak about. He's referring to back what he said back in John 14, John 16. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So who is this comforter? It's the Holy Spirit. He's referring to that. He's specifying that. And that Spirit then came when? At Pentecost. It says very specifically, He will come after me, Shabir. 
It doesn't say that he'll be there at the same time. In John 14 and John 16, both say that this comforter will come after me. Good. 50 days later. First, I agree with, with Smith, and uh, since I've been rebutting him all the time, I may as well give him credit. When he says that the, at the Council of Nicaea, the books weren't uh, decided upon at the time, many Muslims have this misconception to think that 325 AD, that's when the books were first selected. No, there are ancient um, records that show that Christians were, before the Council of Nicaea, using four Gospels and many of the texts which are now in the New Testament. So it may be that at the Council they made that decision now to ratify what the Christians were already doing. <coughs> However, uh, what I want to point out is this. Smith says, well, this doesn't mean that the Gospels were created at that time. Because that's the first record we have that the Christians made this kind of decision. And he's right. But why is it when it comes to the Quran, the first inscriptional evidence we have of the Quran, that's the one we're going to take. It didn't exist before the inscription, you see. But when it comes to the Gospels, it must have existed before the inscription, and he's right. You know, if somebody draws up a list of 27 books, the books must have been in circulation before. Somebody looks at the books which Christians are using, and then he draws up the list. The books existed before the list. This is true. The Quran existed before the inscription. Muhammad, on whom be peace, was already considered to be a messenger of God before the first inscription says that. Second point. Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. We have to look at it from God's perspective, and this is the problem. Often the Israelites who wrote the Bible wrote it from their perspective, trying to uplift the Israelite race and demote the Ishmaelite nation. But even so, we find every once in a while that something about Ishmael crops up, some reference concerning him, placing him in high regard, considering him as the son of Abraham, that the promise of God pertains to him as well. But it's not God's perspective. When somebody writes in the Bible, no, Hagar is, the free, is a slave woman and Sarah is the free woman. So the son must come from the free woman, not from the slave woman. What has that got to do with God? To God, the slave is just as good as the free person. It is human beings who enslave others, but God can give honor and dignity just as he promised to Abraham that he will make Ishmael also a great nation. Did Jesus fulfill that prophecy? There are indeed several sayings in the Bible where Jesus himself speaks as though he is the one who has fulfilled that prophecy. But we know that these sayings were written long after Jesus, and when we compare the Gospels and we see what Jesus said from one to another, we notice not only that the sayings are contradictory from one to another, but this is important, that the <laughs> sayings of Jesus develop in a certain direction over time. The sayings become more Christian as it is being told and retold, rewritten from one Gospel to another. So that the later the Gospel, the more it shows that Jesus is the Lamb of God who died for your sins, the more it shows that Jesus is the Son of God, the more it shows that Jesus is the one who fulfilled the prophecy which was already told about him. But Smith quoted Acts chapter 3 verse 24. Read the whole passage from 19 to 24. You will see that Peter is saying that that time which was promised has to be fulfilled. But in the meantime, Jesus has to remain in heaven until that prophet comes who is spoken about. That would be my interpretation. We can argue over it, but I can show you that I, that I have a defensible interpretation that shows that it is possible to see from that verse that Muhammad, on whom be peace, is foretold. Jesus must remain in heaven until the time of restoration happens, which was already foretold in the mouth of the prophet. What was foretold? That a prophet will come, and then Jesus will come back down from heaven. You go to John chapter 14. Why not chapter 16? Let's discuss chapter 16, which is already, I've already mentioned. You see, when I mention one thing, if you jump to another thing, we can't settle the one. But in John chapter 16, there's a clear reference to the Prophet Muhammad on whom he peace. He's mentioned as he, 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 referring to a human being, not it, 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 referring to a Holy Spirit. And if you, if you go to chapter 14, you were the one who said... You were the one who said that the one who the paraclete is in you. It's not me that said that. Now you come back and say, no, he will come after Jesus. And that's my point. That is the contradiction. He's either in them or he will come later on. The scribes couldn't decide and they went changing it around. So, of course, 100% of the prophecies do not fit, but it points, whatever fits, points clearly towards the Prophet Muhammad. On home Thank you.
let me just quote from uh, 14 and 16 since you brought it up. Chapter 14, verse 16. To be with you forever. Was, has Muhammad been with us forever? This is describing who this paraclete is. Go to your own Bibles and read it for yourself. Don't trust us up here. Read for yourself and you come to your own conclusions. Chapter 14, verse 16. To be with you forever. Is a human being. Does he live, live with us forever? Verse 17. The spirit of truth. A human being. Is he distinct from spirit? Is he not? Also in verse 7. The world neither sees him. Did the world not see Muhammad? Of course he saw him. Also in verse 17. Nor knows him. Did the world not know Muhammad? Of course he saw him. They knew Muhammad. He will be in you. Well, now that should tell you. You're saying he is a person. How can a person be in another person? Obviously, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. He is, 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 is pejorative here. It's not even used in the context of, 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 a, of a person. Continue on in, in uh, chapter 16, verse 8. He will convict the world of guilt in, in regard to sin. He will bring glory to me. To who? To Jesus. Verse 14, verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 26. Whom the Father will send in my name. In my, whose name? In Jesus' name. Did Muhammad come in Jesus' name? No. The Holy Spirit did, but not Muhammad. Verse 26 again. He will remind you everything I, Jesus, have said to you. Is this what Muhammad did? <coughs> now this is where it really comes down to, and this is what we have found as Christians. When you look and you compare between what Jesus told and what Muhammad told, what you will find is the gospel that we find with Jesus Christ is diametrically opposed to, the, to what we see in the Quran. And this is, what I, this is my last bit, so let me, let me end off with this. It's very important that you see who this, per, this person is. Because it refers to who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is obviously the Son of God who came down that we see uh, uh, referred to in the uh, very beginning, Genesis 3.15. That's the first prophecy we see of who this person is going to be. Jesus Christ says that I have now here, I have brought the new gospel, but that I will not leave you. I will leave a comforter. For what reason? So that we even today can continue, since the time of Pentecost, we even today can continue to have the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit who is still guiding us to that truth. Now, I don't see that truth in the Quran. I do see it in the Scriptures. There is the fulfillment of that, started right there in Pentecost, but it was continuing on even until today, the 20th century. It's very important that we see the whole flow of what God was doing here. And I don't have time to go into the, the whole flow of what God started from the very beginning of gardening all the way to the end at the time of paradise. But we need to look and we need to understand that this is specific, specifically referring to the Holy Spirit, not to a man, not to somebody who cannot be seen. I mean, to somebody, yeah, right, not to somebody who can be seen, not to somebody who can be known, not to somebody who is without you, but it was, is within you. It's made very specifically, this is the Holy Spirit. The disciples understood that. The, the writers knew that at that time. We need to understand that in the 20th century. On the Song of Solomon 511, 516, you said that this obviously has to be Muhammad because of the fact that it could, it could fit for this, per, for this very reason. Look at the whole chapter and see who it's referring to. It's quite obvious from the entire context of the chapter this is referring to Solomon. This is not referring to a, a prophet that is yet to come in the future. This is referring <coughs> to Solomon. Go back to that. Somebody, a number of people have asked about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Why is it that we've kept them covered up? Why is it we don't? Uh, someone says, why is it that they remain hidden away? They are not remain hidden. You can get copies of it on CD-ROM. I have a copy of the book in my own library. You can look at it and read it. What is with this Dead Sea Scroll? What is going on here? One of the great things about the Dead Sea Scrolls is that the Dead Sea Scrolls, again, are corroboration of what we see in the Masoretic text, are corroboration of what we see in our Old Testament text that, we, that were written in 916. But for the longest time, the, only, the earliest copy we had of the Old Testament is what you saw on that graph up here, alongside all those other secular documents. How do we know whether it was correct? Until the Dead Sea Scrolls were uncovered, they were written about 125 AD, BC. It was then that we could compare and find out that they were almost a, a diametric uh, exact or parallel to, the, to what we see in the Masoretic text. Now that's important because you, you, you need to look, and, and, look and, and ask the same question. Is it important that we do nail this down in history? Is it important that we do have documentary evidence for this? Yes, it is. It is so important. Here's just another proof of what we've been talking all the time tonight. We need to go back and show that that which we read in the scriptures can be trusted. That which we read in the scriptures not only can be tested, trusted historically, but can be trusted because it deals with the whole plan of God from the beginning of creation right to the end. We know where we've come from, we know where we are, we know where we're going because we look at the whole plan of history from Genesis right to Revelation. I don't want to take little passages out of context and say, this is what it's saying. In, in, in the context of all the scripture is saying, it follows the theme. The redemptive process of God, starting from the beginning, who was rejected by Adam and Eve. 
that rejected falls upon us, redeeming us back unto himself, so that we could be with him not only now through the Holy Spirit, but also with him forever in, on eternity. Now that I only see in Christianity, that I only see from the Bible. I ask the Muslims to come up with something better. Thank you. Folks, I apologize in advance that we couldn't get to all your questions tonight. I really would have liked to answer your questions. Uh, but it's been a very, very vigorous debate, and I do enjoy that as well. And I hope that uh, that's been a benefit to you too. Let me answer very quickly some of the points that Smith has just last made. Uh, building on John chapter 14 again, he makes a number of points. But that still remains that you're not dealing with chapter 16. And if Smith is able to build a case on chapter 14, and I'm able to build a different case on chapter 16, what do you have there? A contradiction. And in fact, the new Jerome biblical commentary on the Bible has pointed this out. That the, uh, the things that are said about the paraclete in chapter 14 does not agree with what is said in chapter 16. And the reason for this is that the Gospel of John has gone through several stages of editing in which homogeneous material were added in to an already completed smaller version. So the Gospel of John expanded over time. Just like you roll around the snowball, it becomes bigger the more you roll it. The Gospel of John expanded over time. Other people came and put things in there. That's why the Gospel of John seems to end at certain points, and then lo and behold, another chapter starts again. For example, John usually uh, shows evidence that it ends at chapter 20, but then chapter 21 begins all over again, as though the Gospel has not ended. Yes, you can build a different case, but even if you go with chapter 14, since what I've said about chapter 16 remains, that has not been refuted, that still stands on good ground, let's deal with chapter 14 now. Now, Smith says that, the chapter 14 says, that you do not see him, or you do not know him. And then he says, well, of course, they don't see Muhammad and they don't know Muhammad. So he confuses the tenses. Because, of course, when Jesus is saying to them, you do not see him and you do not know him, of course, Muhammad is not there at the moment. But when he comes, people will see him and people will know him. Now, point number two, that Muhammad will remind people of what Jesus said. Well, I mean, don't laugh about that, Smith. That's what the text says. You said, you said that, uh, they, people saw Muhammad, people knew Muhammad, and this verse says, they neither see him nor know him. But they, the disciples, neither see Muhammad nor know Muhammad. That's right, it fits Muhammad. Even, you know, going with what you said. You see, the more you speak, sometimes you try to escape what is very clear in the text, you're going to trap yourself. Number two, <laughs> that Muhammad is going to remind people of what Jesus said, and that's what he did. Read Surah 5. That God sent Muhammad to remind the people of much of what they used to hide in the scriptures. Yes? Much of what Jesus said when he preached to the people is stated in the Quran so we can have that Christian monotheism based on his teachings. <coughs> Song of Solomon chapter 5 verse 16. Does that really refer to Solomon? Well, then we back to square one. Let me explain. You see, Song of Solomon is not the most pleasant book to read if you're a very religious person. Because it's full of sexual imagery. And people have looked at this and said, Song of Solomon, what is this doing in our Bible? Shouldn't be down there, you know, talking about breasts, and you know, he put his hand in the keyhole, and I felt it turning in my stomach. <laughs> so, they said, look, it doesn't mean what it says. This is not talking about Solomon having a, a marital affair with his bride. This is talking about, you know, a husband and a bride. The husband here must be God, and the bride must be the children of Israel. So God and his people. That's the bridegroom, and that's the bride. Christians came along and said, well, it looks like it must be Jesus and his church. And that makes sense, because the church is often called the bride of Christ. Right? So it's not really a love story here. It's a relationship between God and his people, or Christ and his church. Well, then we can come along and say, why not Muhammad and his ummah? Especially since his name is mentioned there. How close do you want to get? Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, are they a corroboration of uh, Christianity? To some extent, yes. 
God does speak through the Bible as he speaks through the Quran. To some extent, no, because some of the Dead Sea Scrolls material has made it necessary to make significant <coughs> changes, 13 of them in the scroll of Isaiah alone. Now, what was the message that is there throughout the Bible and now comes in the Quran? It is this one, according to Michael Cook. According to Michael Cook, it was the perennial message of monotheism. That is the point he credited Muhammad and whom peace for. So the Prophet Muhammad and whom peace was preaching the perennial monotheism and he, 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 he makes mention here that the Trinity actually gives us an elusive arithmetic. So Muhammad and whom peace restored that pure monotheistic, monotheistic preaching which was the message of Moses, which was the message of Jesus and Muhammad and whom peace reminded us of that message which many people had so, I invite you, I invite you, Mr. Smith, to accept that message which God has been speaking to us through the Bible and finally through the Quran. Thank Amen. you very much. close if you just like to remain seated for a couple of minutes jam shed and so I would like to make a couple of announcements thank you